All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Brainwine School District Board of Education regular meeting. Today is Monday, March 18th, 2024. We are live in the Brandywine High School Auditorium, also via Zoom broadcast. Ms. Harris, may I please roll call? Mr. Scrobot. Here. Ms. Pigeon. Here. Mr. Ackerman. Present. Mr. Heller. Here. Reverend Dickerson. Here. Ms. Stock. Here. Dr. Jagaday. Here. All present. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Heller to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before approving the agenda, I would like to seek a motion to amend the agenda to remove item 7B as in the Consortium request has been withdrawn. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Dr. Ackerman first, Reverend Dickerson second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? <clears throat> motion carries. <laughs> Let's jump right off with our high school reporters. Uh, Concord High School, Michelle Patel, and Katie Frampton. All right. Good evening, board members and fellow community members. My name is Katie Frampton, and I'm Concord's Vice President of Student Council. Today, I'm joined with our secretary, Elizabeth Garrity. Concord has been very busy in the past two months with our community efforts. Since we presented a video at the last meeting for the referendum, our presentation today will cover everything that has happened at Concord since then. Speaking of the referendum, we want to thank our community for voting in a landslide support of BSD. We are very grateful that you all listen to student needs. Our year long contributions to the Be Positive Foundation have continued. As seen in the photo on the left, many student leaders of all grades met with the founders of the Be Positive organization. Joe and Allie McDonough, who, share, who shared their stories and kicked off our grade versus grade online money raising competition for students in Concord. We have already raised $6,600, which is 66% of our overall goal of $10,000. To continue with this fundraiser, we also have a 3v3 basketball tournament between students upcoming that will raise money for Be Positive. Our baseball team took a visit to Lombardi Elementary's first grade classrooms for I Love to Read Month, where they read some lovely stories to the younger students. In our classrooms, we have increased teacher and student morale by decorating the doors all around the school with winter wonderland decorations. For more festivity, Interact Club made valentines for our community members who lived in local retirement homes and sent them out to spread some love. Science National Honor Society and AP Environmental Science students went to the Youth Environmental Summit Conference at the University of Delaware. Students, staff, and administration participated in promoting the Spread the Word to End the Word campaign by signing the pledge to, pro to project and promote inclusivity within our school environment. Next slide, please. Concord students have been sweeping awards in all of different many facets. Our mock trial club, which is new this year, went through four rounds of competing against other schools and came out with two best attorney awards gavels for our senior Jackson Hamilton and sophomore Maura Northney got the best witness gavel. Interact club members recently attended the Ryla Leadership Conference and received first place, granting them the ability to donate $500 to their charity of choice, which was Uprising Athletes. Our Educators Rising group attended the Educators Rising State Leadership Conference and showed off their incredible intellect um, through placing ninth overall as a school within the state of Delaware, as well as winning nine medals for their events. Our Asian American Cultural Association 
hosted their Lunar New Year Lunar New Year celebration. They had lots of delicious food and had over 70 attendees. We had both our choir and instrumental pop concerts, and both were very successful. In the world of music, Concord Players put on our production of Anastasia, performing four different times. A lot of hard work went into the show, and audiences showed a lot of support. In winter sports, we have seen the end of the season with notable athletes. Asad Banks, senior on the Concord boys basketball team who hit the winning three-pointer at the buzzer, scoring, se- scoring 17 points with 10 rebounds in a 49-48 to victory over Newark High School. Ava Kermitis was one of five candidates for Delaware Online Athlete of the Week, being recognized for her astounding diving skills. Emily Lynch, Charlie Bramble, Anna Wade, and Ava Kermitis were placed on the All-State team for Delaware Swim and Dive after their incredible performance at the DIAA State Championship Meet. Congratulations to the amazing achievements of these athletes. Our orchestra students went to see the Philadelphia Orchestra at the Kimmel Center. They watched as the orchestra rehearsed for their upcoming concert, and students learned a lot about professional practices. This week, students, a part of our Advocates for Women in Engineering Club, will be visiting all three middle schools in the district, and they will introduce eighth grade girls to the STEM pathway. They do this through a station method where these young girls will be exposed to different skills, such as online building, using our computer software, soldiering, and conversing with other older students with the hopes to better encourage them to partake in this pathway. Next slide, please. We're also very excited for our upcoming BSD Fest. All of the students in our district-wide Joint Student Council have come together to to plan a community-wide event that centers around mental health. There will be many fun events, and we hope that you all come to join us on April 20th. We have a lot more coming up, but to be brief, our main endeavors will be focusing on the next month with continuing the support of the Be Positive Foundation. Thank you all. Are there any questions? (laughs) Questions or comments? Um, Can you remind me of the date of BSD Fest? Yes, the date is going to be on April 20th. Thank you. Yep. I don't have any questions. I just like to add a comment. I'm always so proud of the work that the students at Concord are doing. And I particularly want to bring attention to the uh, joint student voice. I know that wasn't just Concord, but it was all three high schools that I had the opportunity to attend as well. And I love the idea behind student voice groups where you guys were talking about advocating so that everybody's voice is being heard and talking about how you can be inclusive including in things like BSD Fest. I think that's a really good example to set for our district is finding a way so that everybody's voice at the table can be heard. So I want to thank you guys for setting that example. Thank you. Great. Thank right. you very thank much. Thank you guys. You. Next up, next up we have Mount Pleasant High School, Michael Payne and Osmond Begg. Good evening. I am Mount Pleasant High School Student Council President Michael Payne. And I am Mount Pleasant High School's Student Council Vice President Osman Beg. So to get right into it, we recently had the Greek Night Celebration, its fourth annual celebration. I was very happy to be able to attend. It was on March 1st, and members from several historically Black fraternities and sororities, and even some Latin and Hispanic sororities and fraternities joined us this year to show off their step dancing capabilities and the amazing culture that can be found within these collegiate groups. The culinary program took their trip to Walnut Hill College just this past Thursday, and I was there. The college was just absolutely amazing, and it was amazing to see what we can learn from a college based in culinary arts because I, before the field trip, had not expected there to be an entire college based upon that, but the different fields within, including hospitality and even hotel management for just astounding. The Love for All Sneaker Ball was February 10th and was very well enjoyed by many. And the career fair was just this past Friday with an I attended in the top right photo. And I was able to get several different applications and different opportunities for summer jobs. And in the bottom left, we can see Representative Sherry Dorsey Ann Walker. And she came into the radio station to be interviewed by Stu Student Neja Bailey, 
It was very wonderful to meet her. She is my mom mom's sorority sister, AKA no flex, but she was very lovely. And it was amazing to meet someone who is going to be the first black woman to run for Lieutenant governor in the state of Delaware. And also in the right with the girls in the swim team, we had some students break a 40 year old record, including Elizabeth Bacon. And it was very nice to see our sports continue to foster. Also, our amazing drama program hosted did another stupendous production with Jesus Christ Superstar, as you can see from the poster in the top left there. This play was about a story of a close friend betraying another close friend, and it was a very touching story. All of our students came out to see it, loved it, and could not say enough great things about it. And last but not least, our Blue Gold Club hosted a Valentine's Day party in the bottom right there, where students came together and were able to spend time with their friends, create cards for the loved ones is very nice. It really empowered what Valentine's Day is, which is to show your love for others. Next slide. Some current events that are happening, Mount, is we had a Gender Sexuality Alliances meeting today with a very special guest, Sarah McBride, who is the first transgender state senator in the United States, and in turn, the highest ranking elected transgender official in the United States history. TSA had a, a conference today, and it is also happening tomorrow, March 18th. I was there, and we were able to go to the campus of the University of Delaware and hear from some very smart individuals, which were professors there, and learn several different things. And other students, such as Madison Viola and Cara De Silvia, were able to participate in live competitions. Our school is also continuing our Ramadan prayer room services where students who are Islamic are able to come during the day and practice their religion in a safe, secluded area. And it's very nice, especially as me, I'm a Muslim who also attends Mount Pleasant. And it's, it's very empowering to know that my school really emphasizes inclusion and empowers me as a Muslim to be able to have, practice my faith in school. It's very nice. Uh, how much our school is empowering everyone of different uh, religions, backgrounds, especially as I know this year we're off for Eve, I think like April 10th, which definitely was not a thing in years past. So you're welcome for that. Our school is also continuing our Zen Den mental health services room where students anytime during the day, anytime they just need a break, you know, relax, de-stress, they're able to come down to this room and go through therapeutic sessions, Right, relax, refresh. Our school places a very large emphasis on mental health and make sure you put that first and foremost no matter what. And this is something our school is continue to implement throughout the year. And it's very nice, very incredible. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first off, we have our yearbook coming out and there is our cover in the bottom left. Several students worked very hard over the course of many months to get this out. So I'm very proud of what we were able to come out up with and I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. And the Black Student Summit hosted by Miss Pritchett of the Black Student Union will be on March 23rd, where students are going to be able to go to this event and meet other Black students within the Brandywine School District and other school districts and communicate, learn things about Black history and create a sort of community. Girls Empowered has a meeting tomorrow on March 19th. And as for the Blue Gold Steps for Inclusion 5K, that will be the day after BSD Fest on April 21st. I'm very much looking forward to it, and I'm hoping to run in it, actually. But it is going to be all about fundraising for Blue Gold and bringing awareness. And as Concord, mentioned, Concord High School mentioned earlier, we are also working, all the high schools are currently working on the Joint Student Council BSD Fest that is on April 20th which is hoping to really promote mental health, mental health awareness, especially in the community. And once we're all very hard at work right now, we cannot wait to, uh, to put on this event for the second year in a row. And we were, very, we were looking forward to seeing you all there. And finally, the student trip to Costa Rica, which I am just ecstatic about as I will be able to attend. We are all going to leave the country, go there and explore all around the country, experience many different aspects of the culture, including dance, education, and culinary arts, as I had 
previously mentioned. And we are, are just super excited. We're actually learning even more information on Wednesday, but these are some more of the amazing opportunities for students to have varied education abroad. Uh, thank you. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns? I'd like to just, are you, oh, um, I'd like to just congratulate you guys again on so many amazing activities. I love especially the variety of activities that you have, uh, and particularly the different competitions. I love how um, your school and, and all of the schools in the district we prepare our students to be able to skill, hone in on their disciplines, practice. You've got competitions in sports, competitions in academics, going to different states and the different honors. And I think it's a great example to set because it's the reality of today's world. Our students are having to compete with students across the nation and in some case across the country. And I think that we could all learn from that in, in recognizing that we need to be able able to be willing to compete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I just I just want to say thank you for highlighting um, the support that the school is giving you for Ramadan. I know that a group of students, were you part of that, brought it to the board a couple years ago that um, we needed to add some support for that. So I'm glad to hear that, that that's happening. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Brandywine High School, Katie Grant. Hello, board members and audience. My name is Katie Grant, and I'm the vice president here at Brandywine. Unfortunately, Lola had to be called into work today, but she will be here next month. As for the school-wide celebrations, our op talks have been well attended. Op talks are run by the College and Career Center. A guest speaker comes in to share their experience in a career or college experience, and students have the ability to attend. So far, we've had our own school resource officer who brought in his canine dog, as well as representatives of the Blue Coats, just to name a few. We've had a lot. Also, our Unity Day was a success. Students were able to sign a banner at lunch um, to show their commitment to spreading inclusivity. <laughs> Moving on, the Spring Musical Act, Sister Act, was a success. A lot of tickets were sold and a lot of laughter was had. Our environmental club went to the Yes Summit, Delaware's Youth and Environmental Summit. And lastly, the Student Voice Advisory presented at the most recent staff meeting. The group focused on the importance of student and staff relationships, as well as the sense of belonging to our school. The staff engaged in a cahoot where they had guests to guess the panoramic data from our school and have powerful discussions with the students around how to make Brandywine the place to be. Next, we wanna shout out some awesome staff and students from our school. Um, Rachel Bockrath won Swimmer of the Year. Um, she broke two of her own records and she set a new record. Um, this isn't pictured on the slide, but I want to give a shout out to our 400 freestyle relay for breaking um, the 20 year old record and getting um, third at states. Our nurse, Mrs. Scott, won Behavioral Professional of the Year. She will now be in the running for state, which is awesome. Go, go nurse Scott. Um, Emmy Crisetti participated in University of Delaware's interactive, interactive percussion seminar. Emmy was selected to play in the band at the end of, of the seminar, which is a major accomplishment. Um, but this isn't pictured on the slide, but we had six people from the Future Healthcare Leadership Club um, make it to um, states, which means they've had to take a test to move on to states. And at states, they will take another test to try to qualify for the national competition um, in Dallas, Texas. Um, this is a great opportunity for those looking um, to be future healthcare leaders. So that is awesome. And Mrs. Davis received a shout out for her hard work as our school social worker. So go Ms. Davis. And that is all. Is there any comments, questions, or, or concerns? I don't have a question. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say while, while our high school students were here that uh, I just wanted to just personally thank 
all of the high school students um, in our district. And, and I know it was more than just high school students. I know it was middle school students and elementary school students who, who came home and alumni who went home and said and talked to their families about the referendum, talked to their friends about the referendum. And um, I just want to you know thank you again for all of your creativity, all of your hard work, all of your uh, belief and, um, and, and all of your support for those who teach you every day, those who greet you every day. And, um, and you know, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, for helping to, you know, get, get, get the job done. And, and um, by far, you know, no, uh, just with all due respect to everybody else in this room, um, the products that the students came up with, they, they were very, they were the most enjoyable for me to watch because it's, it's about you guys. So thank you again. I'll echo my fellow uh, board member, Kim, especially one of the things that I love about Brandywine is the way that you guys celebrate your teachers. I, I watch your Facebook page throughout the week and throughout the month and how you highlight the different teachers and aides that you have. And I think it's really important because I feel personally, and I think everybody in this else in this room would agree that our teachers and our aides and our staff in the schools, they are the professionals and they are the ones that know what our students need. They coach you guys, they guide you guys every day. They've gone to school for this. They're in the buildings. And so we value their feedback. We want them to be at the table for key decisions that we make. And so I'm glad that you highlight them because we certainly want all of our teachers, especially at a time like now where there's a teacher shortage, to know that we value your voice and we want you at the table where we're making decisions made because you are the experts on our students. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Katie. Thank you. Hooked up starting with our special presentations, a Wilmington Learning Collaborative update from Dr. Burgos. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Holler, members of the board and the larger uh, Brandywine School District community. Uh, tonight, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I certainly want to recognize the wonderful presentations from the student leaders who came before me. And I will say, as I listened to every word, um, I couldn't help to beg the question of, of myself and the WLC community, are we preparing students who are charged and positioned to be such thoughtful, intentional uh, leaders. So it's something I'm leaving with here today is certainly energized, but what I heard, what I saw, and doubling down on our commitment to prepare students uh, to, uh, to lead. Um, it's been a busy six months, so much to share. I'll try to be as concise as possible. Um, we'll start with a quick overview. Um, the first six months, um, some of the many things to celebrate is um, first and foremost, our first uh, landscape analysis of all nine schools uh, in partnership with TNTP. We engage in the Opportunity Scorecard Project. I'll tell you more in just a moment. Um, our ELT innovation projects, we are currently um, uh, in the throes of our third cycle. Uh, of course, um, our website is officially, uh, will be officially launched in May, but for now you can visit wlc-de.org and register to attend our Connected Communities event on April 3rd. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, building the WLC team, I'm excited to share that we hired our first uh, two leadership team members, a Director of Educator Pathways, who is currently on the ground supporting uh, our educators and um, continuing uh, their journey towards certification with the emphasis on our powers as well as our long-term subs and our aspiring educators uh, throughout our community. Um, our site-based community councils, uh, as many of you know, tomorrow evening is our March WLC uh, council meeting, and we will uh, be discussing in detail uh, the charge to create nine uh, community-based councils at each of our schools that will work uh, together uh, to really uh, push forward a, a strong, deep uh, family engagement strategy. Um, summer learning, uh, we're at the height of planning and solidifying our plans for the nine schools. And then uh, I'll end uh, with a uh, personal invite to next month's event. 
All right, first I wanna highlight our educator leader team innovation projects. And I'll just um, say that this was certainly an exercise in shared decision-making. When our ELTs came together across the nine schools, we thought that it would be uh, no better way to really to jump into the work than to give um, each of our teams their first charge. Look at your school plans, think about an outcome you'd like to shift and pilot a new solution. Uh, our schools came up with um, some amazing ideas from sensory hallways for our youngest learners to doubling down on how we progress monitor um, learners across tiers when it comes to uh, mathematics uh, mastery uh, to family support models and strengthening those ties between home and school. Um, I can go on and on, but I certainly wanted to highlight the fact that we ran three different cycles, meaning schools had an opportunity to, and I won't say apply, I would say propose an idea uh, that we then rallied behind and supported. And again, this wasn't a approved, not approved, because we certainly know that these are funds that all of our school partners are entitled to. Our goal was to um, build capacity and thinking strategically about how we roll out new solutions, how we progress monitor, and how we measure success. This year, we partnered with the New Teacher Project to really create a baseline um, and, and conduct a deep dive into our teaching and learning systems. We know to um, reverse the trends uh, in terms of student outcomes across our schools, we're going to need to dig deep into our systems. Uh, but we also knew we had an opportunity to gather a snapshot of what's currently happening in our classrooms. And we did that through what we call the Opportunity Scorecard Project. Now this project is based in research and I encourage everyone to read this report uh, called The Opportunity Myth. And what TNTP gathered through their research is that many students uh, spend most of their time in school without access to four key resources. And those four resources are one, great appropriate assignments, two, strong instruction, three, deep engagement, and four, adults who hold high expectations. And that's exactly what this project um, uh, sought to unpack for each of our nine schools. So what this entailed was a team spending a full day at each of our schools, uh, observing classroom instruction, hosting educator leader focus groups, examining student work products, gathering survey feedback from students, teachers, school leaders, and families, and really uh, uh, capturing a snapshot of where we currently are. Um, we received our first uh, round of reports, and these were individual uh, school level reports uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, February 28th, I believe. And we are expecting our second round of reports. And those reports will include one overarching WLC report and then individual district level reports. And the WLC report will be shared publicly. Right now, the individual school reports are being internalized by each of our school communities. Um, we met with um, our nine WLC principals collectively, and we walked through the reports to make sure we understood uh, the analysis, the process, and and how and and what the reports were actually telling us. We did that with the TNTP team and their data analytics team. So it was a great conversation that we had at our um, March uh, WLC principal meeting. Now, I'm not going to go into the details, but I will share just two findings, and I'm going to share them without uh, labeling schools. So you'll see that the schools are numbered in no particular order. Um, and I'm doing that in all fairness to the schools that are still sitting down as a community and internalizing these reports. Um, so some of the data that we captured, I think the you know one of the biggest uh, takeaways for us was around uh, mindset and high expectations for students. You'll notice across our schools, and uh, for those who can't see the numbers as as uh, clearly, we're talking about no greater than twenty five percent. So when it came to measuring the percentage of adults. Uh, leading learning for our students with high expectations for student success, uh, we saw that those results were very low according to this um, process. So we know there's a lot of work to do in, in increasing our understanding of what our children are capable of. Um, another key finding was this idea of grade appropriate assignments, which of course ties right into um, the expectations we hold for our students. You'll notice across the nine schools, lots of variability when it comes to the percentage of time that students are spending with grade appropriate assignments. 
again, I'm not going to go into uh, many of the details, but I think this um, what this tells us is that there's a, a lot of work and a great opportunity for us to really um, provide increased supports to our educators and our school leaders when it comes to raising the bar um, for around student expectation. All right, um, site-based community councils, very excited about the proposal we have on the table. Um, we know that family engagement spans much further than the occasional uh, literacy and math night, the occasional family dinner. We want to create um, a group of, of true family advisory councils. We want this ca these councils to be made up of our families, our community partners, as well as our school staff. Um, we have a three-phase process. Again, um, you'll learn a lot more of this in the coming weeks, but I would like to tell you what we anticipate um, across the three phases. First and foremost, Partnership asset mapping. We have a lot of partners across our nine schools. We need to do a deep dive across the nine WLC schools and better understand who's in our building, um, what needs are they serving, and what are the current outcomes, and what are the existing gaps so that we can address those. Um, the other piece uh, in terms of the phase two of our work is bringing our nine councils together. We know that many of our schools operate in silos. We wanna break down these silos and bring our community councils together. So we're sharing resources, building capacity and advocating uh, for our students and, and, and educators uh, collectively. And then finally, um, you know, in, in order to continue to strengthen and grow, we have to place an emphasis on how we're gathering data. We need to be very public and transparent about our data. So that is another um, piece of this work. We can keep going. So phase one is going to uh, begin in April and span for the next six months. And during those first six months, we'll be doing that asset mapping and building out the registration process uh, for our council. Um, I'm trying to be quick. <laughs> Summer learning right around the corner. Um, so many of our school partners have plans in place. As a WLC, we wanted to make sure we were supporting those plans and filling any existing gaps. Three of the programs that we're uh, currently funding and supporting uh, through strategic partnership, uh, we're increasing the number of high dosage tutors at many of our schools uh, through Reading Assist. Um, we're also uh, working with the YMCA uh, to provide evidence-based literacy and math uh, support at some of our sites uh, through the Scholastic Scholar Zone. And we are um, partnering with uh, the Smart Summer Team to provide our students um, a literacy and science intensive experience at the Cab uh, Calloway School of the Arts. So what's ahead? We're wrapping up our planning year. We now find ourselves getting ready for our final uh, opportunity scorecard reports. Um, we'll be able to share more uh, in April around where what that tells us about where WLC schools are. Um, during April, we will also gather our community. Um, and I'll close on that note in just a moment. Um, in May, we will really put a stake in the ground. What are our action commitments? What is the charge that we're leading with for next year? What this, what will this look like in terms of cohesive supports around our nine schools? Um, and then what is the summer professional learning plan? And then finally in June, we hope to be able to unveil a WLC school performance framework. We started this work with our principals. Again, this does not replace any of the Delaware expectations. This simply allows our WLC schools as a collective to identify some additional metrics that they care about most and want to uh, progress monitor. And that includes teacher retention, as well as student and staff wellness. Our big shifts, um, and I'll give you a snapshot of where we're going. For next year, the WLC has three big shifts, and I'm gonna state them very clearly, concisely. First and foremost, students first. As simple as it sounds, we consider this a shift because it's not currently happening everywhere. Um, we often, we're often experiencing um, adult-centered decisions and we wanna make sure that we're placing student outcomes at the forefront of every decision we make. Secondly, connected schools. Um, we know in order to strengthen our educational community, our ecosystem, we need to bridge uh, these uh, communities. And then finally, um, purposeful partnerships. A lot of partners are working with us. Let's make sure that we have a collective uh, approach to accountability. That being said, 
I invite everyone to join us on April 3rd at 5.30 p.m. at the Delaware Contemporary Museum um, for an evening of, of really digging into our proposed action commitments for next year and gathering community feedback on uh, the direction of the WLC. The primary target audience, of course, uh, for this convening is our families. We also welcome our educators, our leaders, and our school partners, and we also know uh, what time of year it is. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, I'll welcome any questions. Dr. Burgos, thank you so much for your um, presentation and for all of your work on, on this initiative. I know this is, I can't imagine that this has been easy um, whatsoever. Um, I was, obviously, it's very disheartening to see some of the statistics that you have given us. I'm wondering, um, you don't obviously have to share like specific data with us, but is there any way that we could get a copy of the survey tool that you use? Um, just the questions that, that um, that were asked or just the areas that were of focus to um, kind of come up with some, just, just I'm trying to wrap my head around um, how we arrived at such some disheartening data. Absolutely, the TNCP team has provided us with a number of resources, not just the reports themselves, but sample reports that detail um, the different components as well as some support videos. Um, so I'm happy to work with Superintendent uh, Holler to get uh, everyone access to those resources. Yeah, appreciate it. Dr. Burgos, I certainly want to commend you in the work that you've been doing with the Wilmington Learning Collaborative so far. The issues that uh, the collaborative are addressing are really deep rooted, uh, deep seated issues that uh, hinder the, you know, really can create barriers to education. And I have to say that I'm inspired by the process that you're taking them. You recognize that because of the issues that you're trying to address, that it does take a collaborative approach, but not just collaboration from key stakeholders, a very intentional process. You talked about gathering data, uh, gathering data from the schools, gathering data from the parents, and you also talked about coming together at the table and everybody being honest about that and looking at the data together to get different perspectives on how to move forward. Um, I want to commend you for that. And I have to say that I'm really inspired as a board member. And I hope that some of the issues that the collaborative is addressing directly, that we as a board will begin to talk and have honest com or continue to talk and have honest conversations about, but also that we will also take some deliberate and um, intentional steps towards collaborating in order to address those issues, both at the school level and at the district level. Um, we see that with our students and the way that they have organized themselves around student voice. And I, I hope that we'll see that at the district level as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burgos. Appreciate your time. Mrs. Uh, Grobat, while, while we transition, I will make one quick comment, if I could. Um, our WLC school is Harlan Elementary, and uh, I got a, an email from uh, the principal of Harlan Elementary to her staff expressing just at how excited she was that in the big robotics tournament last Saturday, that Harlan tied for first place and uh, their teams want third, fourth, and fifth places as well. Out of approximately 59 teams and over 352 matches, the Harlan Roboteers almost swept the entire event. What an outstanding I, too, will applaud Dr. Burgos and her leadership, uh, what she's managed to accomplish in the short time she's been here. I've said it before, absolutely amazing. Uh, when you find a leader uh, like uh, the one we have in her, yep, you, you hold on, and uh, she's going to take us to great places. Thank you, Dr. Burgos. Thank you. Next up, uh, Special Resolutions State School Counselors of the Year nominees. Uh, Dr. McKinney and Ms. Grimes Stewart. Good evening, President Scrobot, Vice President Heller, members of the board, Superintendent Holler, those of you who are assembled here, here, and those of you who are joining us virtually. 
Again, my name is Dr. Yolanda McKinney. I'm here tonight with Ms. Tammy Grimes-Stewart to honor five BSD counselors who were nominated for Delaware School Counselor of the Year. At this time, I would like to ask those counselors who are present tonight to please join us at the podium. You can give them a round of applause. You can go to the next slide. So I've had the pleasure of working with our school counselors in this capacity for the past several years. To say that they are some of the hardest working members of the school, school community would be a gross understatement. So with that being said, National School Counseling Week 2024 was recognized February 5th through 9th to focus public attention on the unique contribution of school counselors within U.S. school systems. This year, there were five BSD school counselors nominated for Delaware School Counselor of the Year. Jean Beadle from Mount Pleasant High School, Susan Gould from Lombardi, Lauren Kaplan from Springer, Tina Lombardo from Mount Pleasant Elementary, and Tiffany Stewart from Maple Lane Elementary. Now, Ms. Stewart will share with you a little more about each of the nominees that are here with us the one nominee who's here with us tonight and the other nominees who were unable to join us. Good evening. Just a little bit about Ms. Jean Biddle. She started her school counseling career in 20, uh, 2007 and joined Mount Pleasant High School in 2015. Jean doesn't know how to do anything other than support kids and loves working in a high school. She said there is no, no more valuable pursuit than ensure, ensuring that young people feel loved and supported daily. Thank you, Jean. Next, we have Ms. Susan Gould. She has worked as a school counselor for BSD for a total of 19 years, beginning at P.S. DuPont Intermediate and then at Lombardi Elementary. Ms. School feels that in addition to formal counseling in her office, there are endless opportunities all day long to really build relationships and support kids informally throughout their day. Thank you, Ms. School. We have next Ms. Lauren Kaplan. Over the course of 13 years, Lauren has had the incredible opportunity to serve as a school counselor at Springer Middle School. Lauren considers it a great honor to be invited into the lives of middle school students and to assist them in becoming the best versions of themselves that they are capable of becoming. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. We have next Ms. Tina Lombardo, and she is a school counselor, our second year school counselor at, at Mount Pleasant Elementary. She, once she obtained her degree, she started working at MPE, and she has felt fulfilled, rewarded, challenged, welcome, and whole ever since. Tina loves her job, students, and coworkers. Every day, she looks for a way to make a difference. Thank you, Ms. Lombardo. And with us tonight, thank you, Ms. Tiffany Stewart. She has been in education for 20 years and Maple Lane has been her home for eight years. And she has been the only school counselor at the school for seven years and county. Maple Lane School Counseling Program ensures that all students soar, which is safe, owners of their choices, achievers, and respectful. Through rigorous programs and curriculum encompassing diverse and equitable equitable access for all. Tiffany loves seeing the success of all her students and watching them achieve their maximum potential. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Great, thank you very much, congratulations. Uh, I know we didn't change it on the agenda, but we had a last minute scratch for elementary basketball league that we'll have to move to a later date, uh, which moves us to BSD Friends of the Referendum 2024, Mr. O'Hanlon, Dr. O'Hanlon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak just a brief few moments here. On February 13th, uh, 2024, the Brandywine School District witnessed the power of impact of community through the successful passage of the 2024 operating referendum. Our referendum vote netted the largest margin of victory, 76.24% recorded in the state history for any district operating referendum. 
That that was not a mistake. That was not a clue. That was hard work. In addition to Brandywine, four other school districts have held a referendum since 20, 20, December of 2023. And of those four districts, the highest margin of victory was 70%. So just to put that in perspective for you as far as what the victory was for the Brandywine School District. In the weeks and months leading up to the referendum, our community came together in extraordinary ways. Parents, staff, community members, students, members dedicated down, countless hours to an understanding to understanding the need for the referendum. They did so by communicating its importance and encouraging broad participation to vote. And so their efforts were instrumental in not only passing the referendum, but also fostering a sense of a strong and united school community. And this evening, I would like to recognize a group of parents and community members who came together as the Friends of the Brandywine Referendum Committee to help support the passage of our referendum. Their support, their unwavering support, their tireless efforts, their dedication, and the belief that the Brandywine in the Brandywine School District have affirmed that we truly are 16 great schools and one strong community. So I would ask that Ms. Sarah Stowens, Ms. Marjorie Elsey, Ms. Kelly Giles, if you're in the audience this evening, please join me up here so we could recognize and thank you for your tireless efforts on behalf of the Brandywine School District. This was a commitment, uh, uh, unless you were involved in this campaign and campaigns before, their, their efforts were um, unbelievable. Unable to make it this evening are uh, Ms. Phoebe Bosma and Mary Beth Baxter. Um, they are the, uh, Mary Beth was the uh, chair of the Friends of the Brandy One Referendum Committee. And Mary Beth's leadership, uh, a lot of us got to know Mary Beth uh, very, very well over the last couple of months. Her, her leadership mobilized a dynamic a dynamic team of individuals who galvanized a community-wide effort uh, that played a crucial role in helping the referendum pass. And so I, I can't, on behalf of the district, we, guys, we can't thank you enough for, for all that you did for us. I know I had shared my comments, you know, here at Brandywine the night of the election as we were you know gathered to watch the results roll in and you know Dr. O'Hanlon said it and we kind of said it at the last board meeting uh rolling into the referendum but you know truly a community effort top down you know the engagement of our students the support from our teachers and staff um you know the work of the admin team to put all the town halls together and you know, the board members' attendance to go out and really share the message, reach as many people as we can, you know, fielding questions from uh, the taxpayers and members of our community. And, you know, the 76% is just, you know, reinforcement to me that, you know, the community approves of what we're doing and they feel that we're on a good trajectory, a good path. And, you know, I was so ecstatic to see you know, such a great turnout and such a big number, you know, to support the work that we're doing as a board and as a district. And I look forward to continuing that in the future. So thank you very much for all the personal time that you committed. That'll lead us into superintendent's report, Mr. Holler. Mr. Scrobot, Board of Education members, as always, I'm excited to share this monthly update to showcase the amazing things happening throughout our district. As a reminder, this is just a mere snapshot of everything that's happening. We have 16 great schools that are all doing tremendous work. I'm pleased to present this month's report which is especially significant in the wake of the successful passage of our operational referendum last month. This milestone marks a pivotal moment for our district reflecting the collective will and dedication of our entire community to continue to offer the high quality of programming and to continue to build upon the positive trajectory we are experiencing. As Dr. O'Hanlon mentioned in his presentation, our referendum vote netted the largest margin of victory, 76.24%, recorded in state history 
for any district's operating referendum. On behalf of the district, I again want to thank all the members of the community, those with students in our schools and those without, for your trust, commitment, and belief in the future of our students, staff, and programs. There's a reason why the slogan says 16 great schools and one strong community. Thank you for being that strong community. Each year, Delaware Secretary of Education honors select students from the current graduating class for their exemplary work ethic, dedication, and accomplishments both in and out of the classroom. Congratulations to the following students who have been recognized as 2024 State Secretary of Education Scholars. Your hard work, dedication, and commitment to excellence have distinguished you as exemplary scholars and citizens of our community. As you continue on your educational journey, know that you carry with you not only our best wishes, but also the admiration and respect of our entire school community. Congratulations to Brandywine High Schools, Alti John and Olivia Erskine, Concord High Schools, Emily Lynch and even Evan Moe, Mount Pleasant High Schools, Osman Bajic and Caitlin Cove. Nourishing Neighbors is a charitable program of the Acme Markets Foundation and aims to eradicate childhood hunger in America by keeping food banks stocked and supporting meal distribution programs at schools. Through Acme's partnership with Gen Youth, a school-based national nonprofit dedicated to nurturing child health and wellness, BSD has been recognized for the work throughout our district in providing for the communities that we serve. BSD is slated to receive $11,300 in $25 ACME gift cards through the gift card bank on behalf of ACME Markets Foundation's Nourishing Programs, Nourishing Neighbors Program and Gen Youth. These gift cards will be used to provide support to students and families throughout the district. Concord High School mock trial team competed against 21 other high schools on Friday the 23rd and Saturday the 24th. Our two teams, prosecution and defense, prepared opening and closing statements and examination questions for four rounds of competition against four other Delaware schools. As previously announced, Jackson Hamilton won two best attorney gavels and Maura Northey won Best Witness Gavel. Congratulations. There's no question that a healthy economy requires a strong workforce. A skilled and educated workforce draws businesses to Delaware and encourages existing businesses to stay and expand. Whether college bound or preparing for a technical or trade job, individuals need to be equipped with the knowledge and skills to be successful. Superstars in Education and Training seeks to celebrate innovative programs that contribute to developing the state's workforce of today and tomorrow. Since 1989, the awards program has been recognizing educational programs for innovation and impactful programming. The Delaware State Chamber of Commerce and its affiliate, the Partnership Incorporated, are pleased to announce the 2024 Superstars in Education and Trainings Award winner, all of which exemplify creativity and efficacy in workforce development initiatives. While many go through the rigorous act application process, only a handful of winners are selected each year. The Superstars in Education and Training Program welcomes three new superstars to its roster, including Brandywine School District's high school engineering program entitled Empathetic Engineering. The Empathetic Engineering Bridging Innovation for Special Needs program transforms lives through student design solutions. This advanced level design and engineering program offered in all three BSD high schools focuses on human-centered design to empower students to create inclusive solutions for individuals with special needs. From assistive technology devices for physical education 
to innovative workplace tools. Students develop empathy and an understanding of diverse needs while also gaining valuable design and engineering skills. Their creations enhance accessibility and directly improve the lives of others, fostering a sense of purpose and social responsibility in the students and the wider community. Congratulations to the Brandywine High School senior Gabrielle Smith for receiving a 2024 National Center for Women in Technology Aspirations in Computing High School Delaware Fish Affiliate Honorable Mention. Gabrielle is being recognized for her demonstrated interest and passion for computing and technology, contributions she's shown in her classes and her aspirations to pursue a career in technology to solve problems and positively impact humanity through responsible technology advancement. Again, congratulations, Gabrielle, and congratulations to her teacher, Ms. Jeanette Wilt, who's in the audience this evening. There's still time to visit the Young Brandywine Artist Exhibit. Students and teachers have done an amazing job this year. And this year's Gala Nights have recorded an attendance of 1,300 attendees. That's a record breaker. You have one week left to visit the secondary show. The event runs through Tuesday, March 26th. For those of you who were unable to make the elementary arts exhibit, the 360 walkthrough of the elementary round of the Brandywine Artist Exhibit is available on our district website in the district's visual and performing arts page. You can move 360 degrees around each photo with a mouse, physically move around with an iPad, phone, or tablet, or go full virtual reality and view with a phone and a VR headset. The arts are alive and well in the Brandywine School District. I've had the privilege of saying that several times during my reports. This month's report proves that to be true. March is designated as Music in Our Schools Month by the National Association for Music Education. Join us as we celebrate the importance of music throughout our schools. We believe that music education is a critical component of a well-rounded educational experience. It fosters creativity, enhances academic performance, and cultivates emotional expression and social skills. Our dedicated music educators work tirelessly to provide high-quality music programs that inspire students and encourage a lifelong appreciation for music. Throughout this month, we'll showcase the talents of our students and the dedication of our music teachers through a series of concerts, performances, and special events. We invite our community to join us in supporting and celebrating the achievements of our young musicians. March is also designated as Theater in Our Schools Month. Theater education is more than just learning how to act. It's about storytelling creativity, collaboration, and understanding diverse perspectives. Through theater, students learn to express themselves, develop empathy, and gain confidence. Our dedicated theater educators work passionately to nurture these skills, provide students with opportunities to explore their talents, work as a team, and engage with the world around them in meaningful ways. This past Saturday, March 16th, all nine BSD elementary schools and other elementary schools throughout Delaware participated in the largest robotics event in Delmarva and the second largest robotics event on the Atlantic seaboard. BSD students' innovative thinking, teamwork, and technical skills were on full display as they tackled complex challenges and showcased their robotic creations. This event not only highlights the talent and hard work of our students, but also underscores our commitment to providing cutting edge STEM education. We extend our heartfelt congratulations to all participants for their impressive accomplishments and thank our dedicated staff for their guidance and support. These young inventors and problem solvers are a testament to the bright future of technology and engineering, and we are incredibly proud of their successes. 
Special thanks to our community member, Foster Shucker, who championed robotics in our district many years ago and continues to remain instrumental in providing our students with so many robotics opportunities. BSD is thrilled to invite our upcoming kindergarten families and students to kindergarten registration nights for 24, 25 school year. This is a wonderful opportunity for families and students to have questions answered, familiarize themselves with the school, and most importantly, make the transition to kindergarten as smooth and joyful as possible. Please visit our district website, look for the kindergarten registration link for dates, times, and more information. And finally, this month's sizzle video. Enjoy. the devices at Ford Elementary School today with our uh, Concord Engineering Level 2 students. Uh, we're um, testing our assistive technology devices made for helping kids with disabilities be able to participate in various sports. Amazing students, amazing staff, amazing parents, and an amazing community. Makes it easy to say, proud to be BSD. Mr. President, that's my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Holler. Comments or questions on the superintendent's report? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for the wonderful report. One of the things that I was truly blessed by, everyone knows how 
strongly I feel about uh, equity and inclusion. And so I want to thank the, the district for celebrating Inclusion Day uh, just last week, where we talked about how we want to make sure that our schools are environments where no one feels left out, where there's a space for everyone to have a voice and every, a space for everyone to be included and involved. So I want to thank you, uh, Superintendent, for inspiring our schools uh, district-wide to be included in that. Would love to take the credit for that, Dr. Jagaday, uh, but can't. Um, it is ha has become an, an institutionalized effort uh, in the Brandywine School District. And I, I agree, you saw that evidenced uh, in the slideshow this evening. That will lead us to our public comment segment of the evening. Um, as always, we ask our speakers and audience members to be courteous and respectful to each other. It's your time to be heard regarding topics related to the Brandywine Wine School District. Each speaker will have two minutes, which time the microphone will end, or we will thank you for your time. Uh, we try to make every effort to be fair to everyone. Um, before we start that and call the first person, do want to kind of make a public apology to our community. Uh, I know last month we had some technical issues uh, that did not allow some Zoom speakers through to speak. So it is my apology for that. And we've made the corrective actions to prevent that from happening again. And last minute check, any Zoom speakers this evening, Dr. O'Hanlon? Having none, we have one in the room today. Uh, Aaron Mullen, Megan Anderson, and Madison Viola. Please you can speak to the uh, microphone there in the aisle. Good evening, members of the Brandywine School District Board, BSD administration, and community members. This is Megan Anderson. I'm Madison Viola, and he, tonight we're here with our advisor, Ms. Erin Mullen, to represent Mount Pleasant High School's Blue Gold Club. Blue Gold is a high school club that promote that works to promote inclusion and connect those with different abilities. I lost <laughs> within the school community. Our club's goal are to create an environment that celebrates the abilities of individuals who are labeled as having disabilities by providing different opportunities for our students with special needs. This year, we have several fun events like a powder puff style flag football tournament, holiday parties, and trying to build support for our unified athletes through pep rallies and participation in different sports. With these events, we have noticed an increase among gen genuine friendships and connections we haven't seen in past years, especially post-COVID. Another goal of Blue Gold is to raise funds for the DFRC, the Delaware Foundation for Reaching Citizens with Intellectual Disabilities. The DFRC is a well-known and respected foundation dedicated to supporting programs that enrich the lives of Delawareans with different intellectual abilities. This year, we're working with the Blue Gold Clubs at Brandywine and Concord to host our big fundraiser, the Steps for Inclusion 5K, which is happening Sunday, April 21st at 9 a.m. at Mount Pleasant. We plan for a day of family fun and friendly competition that will hard that will highlight both our hardworking members and our amazing students with special needs. We recently had the privilege of attending the BSD Joint Student Council field trip this year and recognize how important it is for all the schools in the BSD, BSD community to come together and support each other. We would like to personally invite everyone present tonight to register or walk in the 5K or make it a donation that will support the DFS, DFRC and attend our 5K on April 21st. You can find more information on our Instagram at MPHS Blue Gold, or in the flyers we will have with us tonight. Thank you for your time and support, and we hope to see you there. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do anticipate dusting the winter dust off my running shoes and joining <laughs> on the 21st. Can I just ask a question of, um, uh, do you guys, uh, are, did you say that all three schools have Blue Gold clubs? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. There is no old business this month. Moving us on to new business, discussion and action on potential superintendent succession plan. I'll turn it over to Mr. Holler for the moment. Thank you, Mr. Scorbont. Members of the board, tonight I respectfully request your acceptance of my decision to retire at the end of this school year, effective July 1, 2024. My initial draft of this announcement included the phrase, it is with mixed emotions that I announce my decision to retire. 
but ultimately chose not to include it for a specific reason. Without question, stepping away from an occupation I've enjoyed for 35 years, 31 of which right here in the Brandywine School District, won't be easy. It's never easy to walk away from something that you love and enjoy. However, the use of mixed emotions suggests that the emotions associated with stepping away are in scale with or proportional to the degree of gratitude and appreciation I have for the district or the pride and excitement I have for what's on the horizon for BSD. During my tenure, I've had the honor of teaching students whose influence on my life is as profound as my hoped impact on theirs. I've had the privilege of partnering with families to navigate the challenges and complexities that today's world wages against our children and families. I've been inspired and uplifted by the compassion and dedication of exceptional colleagues who epitomize what it means to put children first. And I am sincerely thankful to have worked with such an engaged and supportive Board of Education. In light of these experiences, using the phrase, with mixed emotions would mistakenly devalue the district's impact on me and my knowledge and belief of what's to come. As I prepare to transition into retirement, I do so with the assurance that our district is in capable hands. I take solace in knowing that the exceptional work underway across our district will continue uninterrupted thanks to the unwavering dedication of our staff and the capable leadership team I leave behind. In closing, I extend my heartfelt appreciation to each and every member of the Brandywine School District community. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve alongside you, and I leave confident that the district's future is bright, brimming with potential for continued growth and success. Respectfully submitted. Chair seeks a motion to accept the superintendent's retirement effective July 1 of the school year 2024. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I will say I'm sure I'll have plenty to say over the, you know, between now and July 1. Um, I know you've worn just about every hat in this district, uh, you know, from classroom teacher all the way up to superintendent. Um, you know, I can't think of a more exciting career. Um, you, know, you joined us at a time when there was a lot of chaos in the world as a superintendent, you know, leading into COVID. Um, you led us through that fantastically. I'm proud of the leadership you've given this district and the accomplishments you've had, not only as superintendent, but in your career. Um, and I will certainly have more to say and hope to, you know, celebrate you before we before we say our farewells. I, I appreciate that. And again, uh, it, it's my honor to have been served and serve in this district. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Ackerman. I'd like to make a motion to promote employee number 24-111 as identified in executive session to superintendent upon completion of a contract with an effective date of July 1st, 2024. I have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes. I'd like to say that um, the way that I came on the school board was unexpected for me. Um, I have a busy schedule, but the reason why I decided to join the school board was so that I could represent my community in decisions of education matters. I have two students who are uh, students. I have two children who are students of the Brandywine School District. And I thought it was very important that we have an objective body that is able to provide guidance to the school district. With that being said, um, I want to read 
a few things from our board, um, school board policies website to sort of provide context for what my comments are. And those are the key responsibilities of Brandywine School District board members. The first one says that we should collaborate with fellow board members to develop strategic plans and initiatives for academic success. Next, it says we should assist in shaping and revising district policy. Third, advocate for students, families, community members, and staff to ensure their voices are heard and concerns are addressed. Next, participate in regular board meetings and contribute to the decision-making process. Lastly, promote transparency and open communication between the board and all stakeholders groups. With that being said, I'd like to say that I believe that the opportunity to provide succession for the school district's highest uh, position of leadership is one that I believe should include transparency, collaboration, and um, decision make shared decision making. I wish that I could say I felt that the motion that just went forth came about through that process, but I do not. I find it difficult to serve as a school board member when I am not aware of what motions are going to be put forth um, for our vote, when I'm taken by surprise by them, when I'm actually been advised otherwise in previous meetings. And I'd say that tonight I'm disappointed because I'd like for us as a board to actually live up to the key responsibilities that we have. With that being said, my position on the secession of the school, school's highest office has always been the same position that we took when we wanted our community to fund our schools for the referendum. We hosted hundreds of meetings in civic associations, schools throughout the community. We came to the community, we asked all stakeholders, we asked teachers, students, civic members, everyone to come to the table in order to help get the funding that we needed for our students to continue to be educated. We did not make those decisions in a vacuum. And that's why we got 70 over 76%. Not because I believe everyone agreed that what we're doing is perfect. It was because everyone came to the table and believed that they had a voice and saw that there was a need to move forward. So my position has been that I think this school district to provide succession needs to open up a transparent process with all, where all key stakeholders can have a voice. Our teachers are the most important people in our school district in our schools in terms of being on the ground knowing what our students need knowing what education practices work knowing what's necessary not only in their building leadership but in district leadership when we came to our community we said over and over again that our human resources was our greatest asset the number of teachers we had was the biggest reason why we needed the referendum because we didn't want a teacher shortage. So I have advocated that we have a process where we collect data from our teachers, from our aides, from our social workers, from our students, from all of the people who make us BSD every day in order to be able to move forward with this, this decision. And I'm ashamed to say that to this date, I have not been made aware of any intentional data collection to seek the voice of those who will be affected by this decision at all. The Wilmington Learning Collaborative stood here and said how they bring together schools, they bring together students, teachers, even universities and key partnerships to gather the data to be able to move forward. As a district, we ask our teachers to only bring evidence-based teaching models into the classroom. We demand data be, be made present in every other policy throughout the district. We even use data to determine 
determine the way that we teach our students with testing and everything. So for us to bring forth a motion that has not been supported by any intentional data is disappointing to me. I think it's a, it's a misjudgment. I do not think it's inclusive. As we have said that we are just last week on inclusion day, and it does, it's, it's, it's disappointing. It really is disappointing. And what I had requested uh, just more than two months ago was that as a board, we come together and we have a discussion about the pros and cons, that we do the research on what the pros and cons would be for having an internal search or appointing someone internally versus opening up and posting the position in the same way that we would post any other position in the district. That has not happened. That discussion has not happened. And so I will go on the record of saying I joined the school board because I believe in equity, I believe in inclusion, and I believe in the responsibility of the board is to hold the superintendent and district leadership accountable. We are not just to be the voice and the hands of leadership. We are to make an independent decision that's based on data, that's based on feedback from community that we represent in order to be able to go forward. And that has not happened. So those would be my comments. And I think that, I, I, and I'll say, I know that I've heard it several times tonight that the reason why we got 76% in the referendum is because everyone agrees that we've done a good job and we need to keep that momentum going. Well, I believe that people voted because they didn't want the dedicated teachers and staff to lose their job because those dedicated teacher, teachers, aides, and staff are the ones that make a difference in these students' lives. And if students and community members ever thought that we would put tape on the mouths of teachers and aides and staff in schools when it came to being able to vocalize their voice and perspective on the most senior position in the school district. If they ever thought we would do that, we would not be sitting here with a 76% approval rate. So that's my feedback. Any additional comments? Um, I, I would echo um, my disappointment as well. It is not, um, in no way am I implying um, anything specific to 24-111, um, but I think that um, When Superintendent Holder was previously appointed, that was for a specific season. Um, I think we would all agree that that time was um, the exception and should not be the standard. Um, I think that we would all agree that those circumstances uh, afforded us that opportunity and it warranted us to appoint um, an interim at the time. Um, and so as we are looking to move forward, as we are looking to uh, take the district to the next level, I think it is it would behoove us to also um, see the process through and explore all of our options. Um, I, 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 also, I would echo everything that um, Board Member Sean said and not feeling heard, um, feeling um, caught off guard by the fear, the the motion that certain board members were privy to this information and others were not. Um, I also um, am hoping that the the even the community will help us to be more inclusive. Um, that you will respect the process enough that you will be, uh, that you would want to take part in the process. Um, and, and for me, it absolutely is about the process itself and not particularly, not, not a specific person. So um, finally, I would say, I would echo um, Dr. Burgos's point in that we make a lot of decisions with adults in mind. Um, 
and opposed to keeping our students at the center of every decision that we make. Um, I think our, our students deserve an honest, open, transparent, inclusive process um, for the highest position in our district. Thank you, Reverend Dickerson. Any additional board member comments? Uh, yes, John, I would like to make a comment. Um, sorry. I think if you talk to many educators and you ask them, one of my favorite questions to ask educators is, why did you become an educator? Why did you choose the classroom? Why did you choose kids? And I think that you'll hear many, many stories similar to mine. More often than not, it was a teacher who inspired them and made them believe that they could do that. It's a dream that I had had when I was younger to be a teacher. And I was blessed and um, God had opened up avenues for me in order to fulfill that dream. And I have been blessed and I have been blessed to represent educators and I've been blessed to represent students in, in this wonderful, wonderful state of Delaware. My husband said to me recently, he said, I don't think that you're happy. And I said, and he said, I think ever since you got on the board, you have not been happy. And I reflected about his words. And to be honest, it, it, it did kind of cut me open a, a little bit when, when he said that. And I realized that being on the board and seeing sometimes an inside view when all you really want to do is just be in a position where you can greet your students and you can collaborate with other educators and you can think about how to make those young people's dreams come true. It's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to see how the inside process works when Oftentimes, as teachers, we had been isolated and we had been protected from a lot of that inside work. And I think that tonight I am, I'm very disheartened. I'm, I, I really, I really, I really, don't actually have a lot of words tonight because I, I'm so disheartened and I'm so surprised that, that this motion has been made. Um, but I, I do want to make it clear uh, to, to the public, to the community that, you know, um, like Reverend Dickerson said, um, like Dr. Jaggedy said, that this is not about an individual, and this is not about an individual's ability. Um, this is this is not about an individual. This is this is about our responsibilities as board. I think everybody knows that um, three years ago I went through one of the most contentious elections because at that time. Some people in the community were saying that they didn't trust a teacher to sit in this position. The irony of that. The irony that there would be people in the community who would not trust somebody with a face that looks like mine. The irony that people would question my faith 
people would question my motives. When all I really wanted to do was to just make things better for kids, to just make things better for people who worked in the buildings. I, I don't know how we are in a position where this may not be an option for the community, for our students, for our families, for our community members, and for our teachers to express any kind of opinion. They cannot even have, they don't even have, they may not even have the option to say what they love about this district, but what they'd also like to see changed. And what kind of a person that they believe could execute those changes. You know, it's interesting because right now in this district, teachers are going through what's called a voluntary transfer process, a VT. That's, for example, if you are a teacher at uh, Mount Pleasant Elementary and say, for, say that you would like to teach at PS DuPont, that's not something where you just like email the principal and say, hey, I want, I want, to, I want to work at PS DuPont next year. You have to apply, you have to make your intention known, and you have to interview. And this is an employee in the district. This is a teacher. This is the same standard that our teachers are held to. I've worked in different states as an educator. I currently work in a different state as an educator right now. I've worked in different districts. I have never seen, I've never seen a process like what may happen tonight. And I think that it's important for every person who came out and voted for our referendum. I think that it's important for you to witness what, what is happening tonight. I don't know if this is a context into the larger speaking of, 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 of perhaps some people's desire to dismantle de democracy, I don't know. I, I can't say, I can't speak to that. All I know is this, is that 76% of the community did not come out because of the seven people sitting up here. I mean, we, I mean, I don't want to say nobody. I, I, I would like to believe my family came out for me to vote. <laughs> um, but not very many people in the community probably thought to themselves, it's because I love those board members, I'm gonna go out and vote. And let's be honest, it's also, they did not think to themselves, I wanna go out and vote for that referendum because I love our senior district leadership. I love them so much. I'm gonna make sure that my vote says yes. You do whatever you want. I will tell you why they probably came out to vote if we cared enough to ask them. They probably came out to vote because they love their third grade teacher, Mrs. Wilson. And they were afraid that if the referendum didn't vote, then next year, Mrs. Wilson may go from a class of 18 to a class of 35, or their beloved neighbor, brand new teacher in the district, might have to get riffed. So that's why they probably actually came out to vote. It was a vote for our teachers. It was a vote for what they do. But the action tonight, well, we'll just have to let it speak for itself. 
me just go about, I would like just to make one quick correction around the voluntary transfer process. Uh, yes, inst- interested teachers do meet with principals and have discussions, but the position goes to the most senior individual that is interested. Mr. President, I've served on this board uh, for almost 30 years. I've been through many superintendent searches. I've been through a search where we had one outside candidate that we came down to as a finalist, and that's the only person that we had as a choice. I saw that person come into the district and cause innumerable problems. I've seen internal candidates that have also had their own problems when they've been gotten the job. I have never seen a stronger senior leadership team in our district than the senior leadership team that sits there now. And maybe people didn't come out for the referendum to vote for that senior leadership team. But at the end of the day, they worked day and night to get that referendum passed. I would have been happy with just one vote passed. And and frankly, I wouldn't have even thought about this type of succession had the referendum failed, because to me, that would have been a clear indication. So I understand the process arguments, and I certainly don't discount them. And I think uh, people just need to look at the team that we have here in this district and appreciate the people who are doing the job every day while we sit here and talk about policy and process. And those people who are doing that job could easily have gotten superintendent slots in other districts and have chosen to stay here. And we should be thankful for that because they're good people. They're respected across the state. And we should be thankful that we have the people that we have in those leadership roles. And I mean, everybody who's over here that I know. And I've heard from teachers who got wind of this potential succession, who said to be pleased, be strong. We're finally being heard by administration. Don't let us down. And I appreciate that feedback from the teacher that sent it to me. And I'm getting text messages as you speak saying thank you for speaking out. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And we've um, never had 158 people tune in on Zoom for a board meeting before. So people care. We've had over 200 or more on Zoom. <laughs> we have. Chair recognizes Mr. Heller. Uh, first, I just wanted to share you can probably hear in our voices is difficult for all of us because we generally. Um, agree on almost all matters and and this is unusual but i just wanted to share why generally um, i'm in support of filling positions from within when there's a qualified candidate Um, i guess most of it comes from my professional life i do a lot of hiring and staffing uh, and senior positions in my professional life and I, i i think in most any other industry or sector that's in the same boat that we are where there's a highly qualified or even overqualified internal candidate with a demonstrated track record of extraordinary achievements and progress. It's, it's, it it would be unusual um, to consider looking outside of the organization when that person exists from within it. And I worry particularly, um, you know, in general, when there's a qualified candidate from within the message that it sends to the rest of the employees in the organization when you say that your your tenure and your qualifications and your achievements and your impact on our organization that that we know that you're a great fit for the position but we're going to take the time to see if we can find somebody better anyway and then if we don't well you're, you'll still be here um just in case and that worries me the message it sends to the rest of the organization that the time that they've dedicated um, to an organization and the contributions they've made at at the end of the day when they're the most qualified person for a position that they might be overlooked. Um, And in this particular case, a big concern of mine is we've been talking for three years about learning loss coming out of COVID. And I think this is the first year where 
across the board, we're seeing such a positive trajectory in, in the classroom. And um, I visited a couple of schools in the past couple of weeks, and it's the first time it felt normal, for lack of a better term for me. And I just can't imagine us considering going into another school year with a change and 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 um, and that kind of upset or 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 tur turmoil and how much time it would take an outside candidate right now to get up to speed and to rebuild the momentum and where we're at even right now, I think would take so much time. Um, and then I, I do want to comment on the feedback piece. I think as a board, at least in my opinion, um, we're, we're constantly um, getting feedback. We're engaged with all the time um, through emails, phone calls, the person who stops you in the grocery store to talk about what's going on in the district, every public comment we hear at every meeting, we we get feedback on building visits when we talk to staff and see what's going on firsthand um, with the students. And I do think that the referendum vote and margin was really loud feedback on, and not to mention the, the hundreds of town halls where we spoke to community members and staff. Um, so that both in general and in this case, that's why I just, I believe when there's a person from within that is extraordinary, it, it would be negligent to look elsewhere. Mr. Heller, I just wanna just um, thank you so much for your perspective. Um, I, I do just want to say as someone who's, who's dedicated my life to education, I find that I get that boards should be made of, of people from all walks of life and all professions. I certainly absolutely respect your wildly successful um, professional career and opinion. Um, I think one of the mistakes that people make though from the outside um, is that they believe that schools should be run, should be businesses. Schools are not businesses. And, and I think that it's important that we understand that schools are their unique um, organisms um, growing, changing, dynamic. Um, because because we serve kids and, and because of that, yes, we can look to some business practices, of course, um, but schools should never be run like a business. One of the things I'd like to add is that I certainly celebrate the successes of Brandywine School District, and I've I've said it at different um referendum meetings. I've talked about my own kids and the success that they're seeing, but I also want to talk about the things that do need to be changed. And while I appreciate saying that we want to maintain momentum, um, there's a lot further to go. And again, this is not about any particular person. It's not personalizing. It's again, I go back to the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. When you recognize that you have very serious issues within education, you take a collaborative approach to addressing those issues. So what I'm talking about is collaboration. I have students, my children go to a school where huge fights break out every day where we they attend school in a district where weapons are found in lockers. When I looked up on the, um, and I hate to be the Debbie Downer because, you know, I, I, again, want to celebrate the success that our teachers are doing and that our, um, our guidance counselors and everyone is doing. But we also need to recognize the really, important issues that we have. Like when I looked up the nation's report card for Delaware, we scored like 226 out of 500, that, out of 500 was the average score of a fourth grade math. The nationwide a score was 235. And when you look at eighth grade, it was like 264, right? We're talking about like really low numbers, and I wish I had recorded all of them, not only are we talking about when you look at the percentage of our students in Brandywine School District that are college ready, it's 28.6 out of 100%. 
So while I, and if you look at reading proficiency is 54%, math is 30%. While I appreciate the wonderful success stories that we put up here and that we should be celebrating, we also need to be talking about those things. And as an African-American woman who has spent, you talk about your career, I've spent 20 something years doing community advocacy work working for the mayor in Washington, DC. Not only have I taught in classrooms in multiple districts, in the Maryland School District, in Boston School District, in Washington, DC, I actually worked at the district level for the Office of Specialized Instruction, where I helped develop their entire program, online program for students who were unable to attend school. I helped write curriculum. I helped do all these things. And so I've seen different perspectives. And so we all have careers. We all have successes. And as a community advocate who is big on equity, we need to, I joined the board so that I could help be part of those conversations. And I came on the board in October. I believe I was voted in October, not once, once, and I've never missed a board meeting or an executive committee meeting, except for the one executive committee meeting where it was a mandatory statewide meeting for board members that I had to miss it. Not one conversation has talked about the inequities of academic achievement in this district. Not one conversation has talked about the disproportionately amount of students of color and students with disabilities who receive discipline as opposed to support. Not one conversation has talked about why we only have 28.6% college readiness. Not one, not one conversation in any of those meetings has talked about why there are huge fights breaking out in my kid's school and why my kids are afraid to go to school on some days or why there's students vaping in the bathroom every day or why our teachers don't have the support they need. Why are teachers who are trained in academics and classroom management and scaling curricula are having to be uh, social and emotional support because there's not enough behavioral support specialists in the school. I have a child who could not be seen by a behavioral support specialist, even though it's on the IEP for months because the second person left in the same school year. Or why at my child's high school, where there's only a handful of African-American teachers, more than several have left within the, third, the few years that my students have attended that school? Why my child was a student at Springer Middle School, and out of all eight of her classes, she had not one African-American teacher? Not one conversation has talked about that. Not one conversation has talked about these things of why when you go to an AP class or an, or an honors class, why do you look around and my daughter who's been in those classes is the only African-American student in those classes. Are there no smart African-American students in these high schools? Why don't we talk about why one of the three high schools has a volleyball team that has no African-American students on the ninth grade JV or varsity team? Why aren't we talking about these diversity issues? So while I celebrate the momentum we've made, there are some huge issues that are not being addressed, which is why we need all key stakeholders at the table. We need mental health providers. We need teachers. Dr. We Jay, need I'm parents. Sorry. We need students at the table who are going to collaborate on what these issues are. Dr. I hear you, and no, I'm going to move on, but because you, we were silenced in other meetings, we because an executive the discussion related to the motion. This is, there is great the point? motion. The motion is something that when an executive oh, committee, plan. in the executive motion committee meeting, when that meeting ended, we agreed on a totally different motion. And out of a uh, motion uh, on the floor is to the motion. Vote what employee John, 24 I respect you. But you will not silence me. It's not silencing. It's, it's it, a matter it's, of it is protocol. Maybe if you'd like to add an because item to I'm a speaking, meeting agenda, I'm speaking the right about the motion. What we're talking about is transparency, and we're talking about why it's important for us to bring key stakeholders to the table. And the point that I'm making are there are some very real issues that are addressing our students district wide. And there are very real inequities amongst our student achievement 
amongst teacher treatment, amongst inclusion. And that's why it's important to have collaboration around who the senior leader is that will be able to address those issues. What I'm saying is we're sitting here talking about, let's go with the momentum. We don't want to disrupt it because we're doing such a good job. And what I'm doing is pointing out what national, I'm a data's person. What national statistics say is we're not doing as good as we could be doing. So what I'm saying is if we take the time to get the collaboration and key stakeholders to the table, the time that it takes is not going to cause us any more problems than what we already have. But the benefit we will gain from it is that we will get very, varying perspectives of multiple professionals, subject matter experts on mental health, on diversity, on, uh, you know, the Wilmington Learnington Collaborative enlisted the local university down there at Delaware State. We've never even looked at using those professionals. They looked at them and they got real information on how to address these issues. Get them to the table to talk about what kind of skills would be necessary in a senior leadership so that we can see real change in our district. That's what I'm talking about. It's all connected. And the very fact of how even as a board, you're trying to silence other board members, it's not right. And we will not silence all of the other teachers and staff that have valid information for how we can move forward. Disagree that I'm trying to silence anyone. We're in a public. I disagree. Having a discussion and everyone is. is and bringing a board, uh, bringing a motion to the table that's different from what you agreed to in the other room just 15 minutes before this meeting. And that only four of you here who met prior to the executive committee meeting no, tonight. No made well, made. so then I won't say I can't prove you met, but you all happened to be present 25 minutes before the meeting started. And then one of the people who were present comes in here and makes a motion that is different from the motion that we as a board decided to no make. No motion made in executive session. I, I, but I don't know if four members can gather without it being noticed. I mean, a half hour before. And four is a quorum. If you have at least a quorum of a board meeting in the same room, it's supposed to be registered and you're having conversation. Our executive meeting and our regular board meeting were appropriately announced within Delaware Sunshine Laws. But it was announced that it started at 5.30, not 5.05. People have arrived at, you know, prior to the meeting, no, not everyone doesn't arrive right at, at 5.29. But the point is that you all got together and decided what you you decided what the motion would be because you yourself as the president of the board shared with someone who is not on the board what the motion would be prior to us coming together as a full board in the executive committee meeting and determining how we were going to go forward with succession. At the last meeting, we decided that we will all come together to weigh the pros and cons of both processes and determine not only for succession, but superintendent evaluation. Every employee in the district is required to have a formal evaluation. And that is lacking for the senior leadership position. So we have made a decision as a board that we needed to be held to the same standard that all other employees were and that we would have a discussion about it. But instead of having a discussion, as we agreed last month, we showed up tonight at the scheduled and publicized time only to find out that you had told someone who wasn't on the board what motion would be made prior to coming into this meeting. As an officer of this board, it is not without of bounds of any protocol to consult legal counsel for advice regarding board matters. We're not talking about consulting legal counsel. It's different to consult legal counsel versus to tell legal counsel, this is the motion that's gonna be made tonight. When you had told the board members that you represent as the president, that you would have a discussion about what motion would be made, about the options for making motions. That's very different. Consulting legal counsel is one thing. You're consulting legal counsel for general parameters. But when you consult legal counsel and you say, this is the motion that's going to be made prior to the publicized meeting of the board members that were supposed to discuss what the options are, that's very different. 
I think we need to be honest and we need to be transparent. We hold our students and our teachers to honesty. If a student plagiarizes, we hold it against them because it's dishonest. When board members are dishonest, we need to be held to the same standard. Mr. President, can we call the questions? Well, I'd like to make my comments. You know, to me, this is a fundamental discussion of you know internal candidate versus external hires. Um, and, and to me, the individual does matter. You know, I agree with my fellow board members as a broader philosophy that there is value in gathering stakeholder feedback. That's not to say that this value of feedback has to come before this promotion that's been motioned. There's absolutely no reason to believe that our next superintendent won't fully engage with stakeholders to seek their input. The well-documented idea of gathering feedback during a superintendent search is to help ensure that the selected candidate is a good fit for the district. To me, a good fit is the experience, management style, personality, and reputation that aligns with the goals of our district. Some of those qualities you cannot gauge so well from an external candidate, as well as you can from someone that you've seen in action. Mr. Ackerman mentioned it a little bit earlier. You know, history has shown us that our external hires, the most recent past ones from Florida and Pennsylvania, have been short-lived and lackluster at best. Our longest tenures and greatest successes have come under the leadership of those who were developed and hired from within. I fully believe that our next superintendent exists in our district right now, and I can't think of anyone who would be a better fit than, than employee 24-111. In giving consideration to our next superintendent, my thoughts on conducting a broader search versus looking internal is not absolute. I believe our circumstances should guide our actions. National School Board guidance on improving the superintendent search process includes two very specific points. The first one being if a board feels good about the direction of the district, and they have a strong internal candidate, the recommendation is to skip the search. And the second point is opening a search just to say you did one does no favors for anyone. I do feel good about our direction and I do feel that we have strong internal candidates. Back in 2020, we were in a similar situation having Mr. Holer, our then assistant superintendent who was more than qualified candidate in our ranks we as a board posted the position. But as we all know, COVID came along, our circumstances guided our actions. And after a brief period under the interim title, we as a board unanimously promoted him to superintendent. I think that has worked out tremendously well as evidenced by the results of the last referendum. Today, I think our circumstances should guide our actions. We are in a post-COVID world and education is still trying to undo the damage. We are on a positive trajectory, recovering from learning loss. And that recovery is due largely in part to the work of our admin team and listening to teacher voices. You know, if members of our board can, you know, come together and recognize the qualifications, value the experience, and come to agreement that employee 24-111 would in all likelihood be the chosen candidate in an open process, it's hard to justify the time, the expense, and the disruption to end up in the same place. I believe we have internal talent with the appropriate credentials who have already proven to be a good fit for the Brandywine School District. In my opinion, to go through the process of an external superintendent search is not in the best interest of our district. And when I say district, that's our students, that's our staff, that's our success plan, that's our momentum, that's our taxpayers. An external search is costly, unnecessary, and potentially adverse to the interest of our districts. The US Department of Education puts the cost of an external superintendent search between $40,000 and $100,000. The Wilmington Learning Collaborative just spent approximately $100,000 on their search for an executive position. Now, they were at the high end and they had a lot of external things added to that. But even considering the low end of that estimate, spending $40,000 would not be fiscally responsible to our taxpayers who just showed us tremendous support for what we're doing. 
In this instance, I actually think it would be a dereliction of our duty to look outside our district when we have such qualified individuals in our ranks who are so well respected across the state. With such qualified candidates who, in my opinion, exceeds the qualifications of anyone we would reasonably expect to interview. And for that, I favor a promotion from within over an external search. Mr. Scrobot, um, I, I would just like to rebut just a couple of things that you said. You actually asked the board at our last, a month ago, uh, for us to send you ideas on what a search process would look like. Um, certainly given your concerns about a costly search, I am in absolute agreement. And given the landscape of, of Delaware and um, Delaware is unique and special, um, and certainly our district is too, um, if you remember, I actually conducted and, and wrote an outline of what our search could look like. And it called for um, internal candidates as well as limiting the number of people who would be interviewed to only four or five, um, if you remember that correctly. Um, it also, it also um, you know, limited the scope of the search, the work of the search, but it did not limit um, including including stakeholder voice uh, throughout that process. Uh, so yes, you are correct. It, it could cost up to $100,000 if that was something that we wanted to do. I don't- I'm not considering the $100,000 figure. Well, I, I know, but I'm just saying, but you said 40,000 to 60,000 then 100,000. Um, so I'm just saying that, I mean, I, I just want it to be clear that when I, I did forward that, outline to every board member to keep that as a transparent process. Um, so I, and also the, the, the two quotes that you made, I also read that article. Um, that was an opinion piece from the NSBA, one opinion piece. I think that if you do research about best practices for a superintendent search, you will find overwhelming evidence um, and, and clear advice and processes about what that should look like. And um, every everything that I had read, and certainly I didn't read everything under the sun, I admit that, um, did call for surveying the community, finding out what the community wants. And again, yes, we could see the referendum as overwhelming evidence uh, that they support the district. They support the district. They support, I'm not necessarily sure that they support their voice not being heard. Um, if you've already, I mean, if you've, if you've already, you know, bought the car, why are you going to go read reviews? Um, you've already bought the car. So I, anyways, but I just I wanted to add to that. I would and argue I, that it's a car that we've been driving for several years. We know it. We know how it operates. Well, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I certainly want to thank you, our fellow, uh, you know, my fellow board member, Kim, for doing all the work that you did at the last meeting. Mr. Osforba did ask you, ask us all to go and to do research on what the possibilities would be. And uh, we did that. And you certainly went above and beyond researching, reading articles, pulling up a full proposal, sending that out to each of the board members for our consideration. I just want to ask, did you receive any response from Mr. Scrobot at the executive committee meeting today? Did he take your research and proposal in consideration in any way at the meeting prior to this? Was it on the added to the agenda as he said it would be? Um, executive committee, executive session is not discussed in public. Session. Was I'm asking Miss, I'm asking Kim if you received any formalized feedback from Mr. Scrobot, who asked you to do research and to come up with options, and you did that research and sent it to him. Did he receive, did you receive any feedback from him that demonstrated that he had read your proposal and took it seriously, either via email or any other way? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. How Did to he respond that. to the email? Did I acknowledge your email, Ms. Stop? You, I believe you acknowledged it, that you had received it. That you received it. Okay. Would you please check your text and confirm that I acknowledged your proposal? 
Oh, I, I said that you acknowledged you received it. Okay. Yes. I thought there was a. a Would thought. you like to elaborate, Mr. Scrobot, on what her proposal said and what you thought about it? No, I would not. Okay. Are we prepared to close discussion? So I have a final, final comment. Um, I would certainly expect that there are voices out there who will not be happy with an internal promotion. Uh, I think that's a good thing. There are certainly those who are not a fan of Superintendent Holer. There were certainly those who were not a fan of Superintendent Holodick. Same goes for every other superintendent before them. It comes with the responsibility of the title. Tough conversations and hard decisions cannot be avoided if we wanna hold people accountable and move our district forward. I believe the proposed candidate can do just that. Continue the progress we are seeing and move our district forward. Employee 24-111 is qualified to be a superintendent in any district in this state. We often talk about recruitment and retention of highly qualified teachers. Shouldn't the same apply to all positions in our district, including superintendents? Any district would jump at the chance to hire employee 24111 if they had the opportunity. We would be foolish to not consider this promotion. I'm pretend. sorry. I'm just I'm just asking, are we still on discussion or is this that, part of the motion that was this, made that Ralph made? Discussion is closed. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, could you restate your motion, uh, Mr. Ackerman? Uh, the motion was to promote employee 24-111 as identified in executive session to superintendent upon completion of a contract with an effective date of July 1. We had a motion by Mr. Ackerman, second by Mr. Heller. We've had full discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. No. no. Opposed. Any abstentions? Ms. Harris, may I have a roll call, please? Mr. Scrobot. Yes. Ms. Pigeon. Yes. Mr. Ackerman. Yes. Mr. Heller. Yes. Reverend Dickerson. No. Ms. Stock. No. Dr. Jag Jagaday. No. Four yeses, three noes. Motion carries. That will move us on to, we removed item 7B, moves us on to item 7C, student code of conduct. First read, Dr. McKinney. Good evening, everyone. I am joined tonight by Mr. Warren Mays, Assistant Principal at Lancashire Elementary, and Mr. John Norton, Assistant Principal at Mount Pleasant High School. We are here tonight to present the first read of the 2024-2025 Student Code of Conduct. I'd also like to acknowledge that we do have other members of our committee here joining us, so I appreciate your support tonight. Good evening to the board, <clears throat> Superintendent Holler. There we go. Okay, at, at least one admin and teacher from each level, elementary, middle school, and high school, were able to join our committee this year. Um, district, uh, district support to ensure perspectives around MTSS, equity, and special education were also taken into play. We also have current BSD parents on our board as well. This year, we added two students from our student voice advisory team. Their voice has been invaluable. Hmm. Members are solicited and brought suggestions from the stakeholders in their areas they represent. The list of names include only those who attended in person, more were included in the other conversations. Although the committee's oversight has changed, the membership has remained overwhelmingly consistent. This team has seen the ebbs and flows of the code. Their consistency and commitment have allowed us to continue to make progress. We first started meeting in December. We have been meeting as a whole group twice a month. We engage in individual conversations in between meetings to be as efficient as possible. This year we started by discussing how last year's changes were implemented. We found that last year's changes were working very well. <clears throat> 
The uh, code of conduct is one way we create and maintain a positive learning environment for all of our students. Uh, it is important to remember that over the past couple of years, state regulations have mandated that MTSS and restorative practices are incorporated into schools, culture, and climate. Over the past years, we have added these components to the code. Uh, this means that students will not only receive a consequence for significant misbehavior as a lesson learned and to uh, deter future misbehavior, but they will also have a restorative component that will focus on teaching the student that the desired behavior and reflection on repairing any relationship uh, that was harmed. Um, this added component increases the likelihood of the desired behavior occurring in a uh, Similar, similar future situations. Thank you. Um, as you see here, uh, this year we are proposing a, a few minimal changes to the code. Uh, the code uh, changes are highlighted here. Uh, board members, you were given a uh, summary page in your packet on Friday to uh, access the working draft document. And I just wanted to add that um, you see on this slide minimal changes because as a process, the committee went back and reviewed changes, the significant changes that have been made over the past couple of years. We talked to teachers, for instance, we talked specifically to English teachers about the changes that have been made regarding plagiarism. So those are just some of the examples of us going back and getting feedback on changes that have occurred in the past couple of years. So as you see in front of you, very minimal changes, one for tobacco and alcohol possession use, first offenses for all grades, and then the mandatory DFS reporting for unlawful sexual contact three. And again, you have all of the strike throughs and red fonts in your board packet. So for the past couple of years, we have heard staff have heard members of the board um, ask for a more user-friendly code of conduct. So this year, the code of conduct committee did form a subcommittee to begin that work. That committee looked at samples from other Delaware schools and schools from other states. We soon realized that it would take more than one school year to complete. So we will continue our work and plan to have that ready for the 2025-2026 Code of Conduct. So we invite you to continue to look through um, the information that you were given in your board packet. This is your opportunity to provide us feedback. And we will be back on April 15th for the next board meeting to have your final approval of the code of conduct. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for us? I have a uh, just a question, if I might. Uh, maybe sure. not pertinent to the changes for this year, but um, Dr. Jagged, I had just talked about um, inequities and in discipline. I was wondering if you could just really briefly share what the data shows and then how um, that's addressed either through the code of conduct or separately. So um, I can get the data for you. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I can definitely get that to you. But I can tell you that what we worked really hard on this year was application of the code so that we could address those inequities and discrepancy, discrepancies in the way the code of conduct was being applied. So we've done um, lots of pulling from our data and having our admin teams um, look at those and determine if they would in fact have assigned that consequence. We also have done some calibration among admin teams. So we are working to address those inequities and I will um, get that data for you. And so I you do, can have the specific numbers. Thanks. As a follow up, I do think that uh, that was a valid point. I know a couple of years ago we used to get discipline data quarterly or every okay. six months or so. I'd be curious to see. see I can it. get that for you. 
Any other feedback? Um, I'm sorry, I, I I did not notice. Um, so pl- so please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it was it was a great list of people who are on this committee. So thank you to everyone who's serving. Um, do we have any student representatives? We do. We have two students. This is the first year that we've had students. So I'm very um, happy to have them on board. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Is there any kind of um, whether it's at the school level or kind of cross district with the same grades? Um, any collaboration or uh, Monday morning quarterbacking to look at scenarios and to make sure that schools are handling them as the same and, um, you know, looking at the nuances between, okay, it, it was a fight, but this one had factors X, Y, Z, this one had factors A, B, C. So in this one, like, is there that level of collaboration to kind of guide and as an ongoing training tool to make sure that, it can be applied equally across the board as it can be. Yes, that does currently exist. We do have um, PLCs for our administrators, um, our APs and our deans at all levels meet. And again, we take real life examples out of our discipline data and they they look through those data, they collaborate, They we give them scenarios um, based on what we see every day when we're in and around buildings so that they have the opportunity to look at the code violation, discuss whether or not they think it's appropriate and how they will proceed as a group. So we've spent quite a bit of time, very intentional doing that this year. Great, thank you. Any additional questions? Great, we will thank see, you. see you next month. No, I, I just say thank you for the redlined uh, copy. It makes it much easier to see You're welcome. The, the changes. Thank you. Next up, we have changes to the school calendar. Ms. Lavina Jones-Davis. Mr. President, can we ask that the um, agenda be updated? Uh, I've got a Google Doc link in my agenda. I don't think the public are able to access the Google lock, you know, Doc link. Is that we for the calendar? Put, we can put the PDF in there. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, we shouldn't have been in there. Is that something you can do on the fly? Or? Oh. Well, we, can, we can straighten that out. Oh, thank we you. Just so want to make sure everyone has a folder. Yeah, good evening, President Scrubbox, Superintendent Haller, our distinguished board members, and everyone present in this room and those joining remotely. My name is Lavina Jones Davis, and I serve as the Director of Community Engagement and Partnership. And also, I'm the chairperson for the district calendar committee. This evening, I have two calendar related items. First, I'd like to bring your attention to the folders that you have in front of you. On the left hand side is the section that I will start off first. A copy of the presentation is included in there for you as well. And on the right hand side, I will let you know when we get to that part that it will be the first read of the 2025-2026. The first order of business is to request for approval to make a change on the 24-25 calendar, our calendar committee, and those who serve on the executive team. We are always looking for an opportunity to have an additional instructional day. If you could bring your attention to the slide for those of you who are in the audience, our board members, you have this information in front of you. So it really explains the request for the change on the approved 2024-25 calendar. In prior years, the statewide professional development day was held in October. Schools were closed to students so that staff could participate in professional development. District was notified by the Department of Education in January 2024 that the statewide PD 
will be held on September 10th, 2024, which is also the state primary election day. On the approved 2024 calendar, the statewide PD is scheduled for October 11th. Students are not scheduled to come to school. The calendar committee recommendation is to change October 11th, 2024 to a full day of school since the statewide professional development is scheduled for September. Move to accept the superintendent's recommendation. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Wait, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so confused. Are we are we voting for the entire calendar? No, this is just, if you look up here, this is a visual also, okay. just in case those who need it would like a visual. If you look at the October month, right now, this is how our calendar for 2024 reads. Look at October 11th. That is a day where teachers come in and students would not have school. But now that that professional development day is in September, we would like for our students to come to school. We would like to have a full day of instruction. So the, Mr. Ackerman's motion is to uh, accept the superintendent and the committee's recommendation to accept this adjustment for this 24-25 calendar. Got it. Okay. That is correct. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Let's move on to the proposed 2025-2026 calendar. And what I have done in the past, for those of you, this may be your first time listening to a presentation regarding the proposed calendar. So I always like to go through uh, certain requirements that we have in developing the district calendar. I'd like to thank all of our members. Uh, this is very, very tedious work. You have to be very organized, constantly counting days, recounting, um, but the members here have been very committed, dedicated. We do have parents. We are looking forward to next year adding a student as a representative here as well. Here is calendar requirements. So before we look at the calendar, we always place those requirements. So of course your legal holidays are included. The right hand of the screen is the school where schools are closed and offices are open. So we make sure that these are added. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to discuss, there is one additional holiday that is added for the 2025-2026. Another requirement is the number of hours that school students are in school, we have to make sure that those hours are met. We also look at our contract or the union contract, BEA, making sure that we reach or meet the requirements for the 188 workdays. I am on the right-hand side of your folder. So as we go through the calendar, I will be going month by month, but only highlighting certain areas areas. I, again, want you to be aware of the requirements that we follow every single year that we work on the calendar. These are the just the breakdown for the 188 workdays. Professional Responsibilities Day, that's typically grading. Perf, uh, parent Teacher Conference, that is listed there as well. And it just gives you a breakdown of even for the August days, uh, when our teachers come back, you will see on the calendar that there are four days that are uh, allocated for that. And this is just the breakdown of how those days are allocated. Next. Here are our highlights for the 25-26 calendar. You will notice that there's a full week of school before Labor Day. We get a full week in. Two full weeks of winter break. And I'll show you once we get to December. And here we have two of our Muslim holidays. 
for 2025, if you look for May 27, that holiday is not represented in the 24 calendar. But when we get to 2025, 20, 26, we will actually have two Muslim holidays that are within the school year before one of the holidays happen over the summer. But in 25, it will happen throughout the school in the school year. Our senior graduation is on Sunday, May 31st. Next. Okay, we're just going to, again, board members, the next uh, packet that we're gonna look at is actually going through the calendar. And as I go through the calendar, if there are any questions, then I will stop to answer. If not, I will just give you some highlights. There wasn't really a lot that changed on this particular calendar. Again, bringing to your attention, August 18th through August 21st, those are professional development days, teachers return to school, receive professional development from the district, uh, also time to set up their classrooms. Usually that Thursday, elementary schools may have a take a peak night. Notice that we're closed on August 22nd, our school is closed, offices are open. There's that full week of school, and then there's Labor Day. Next. Really not much is different here. Um, the parent teacher count, uh, conference, we had some teachers that wanted the conference on uh, October 30th, 31st. We felt that was a little too late. Then we actually did interview a few children and they actually asked that they be in school on Halloween. Okay, those are elementary students having a voice in the calendar. I just have a question yes. about the secondary grades six through 12. Is that something we should note or? October 6th, on October 6th. On October 6th. So I don't know if that is a typo or not. I have to revisit that. By the second read, I'll bring that to your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Thank you. I have a question on this month too. Um, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, that October 10th day, we don't have the ability to choose what that day is. Is that correct? Right. What that that is for no school for students, offices open, professional development day. So again, we don't know if that state day um is going to be there. We always have it in October because it always falls in October typically, but this coming year is going to be in September. So we're not really sure. If it falls in October, do we get to choose a date? It, it seems to me it would be better to have that day on the 3rd than the 10th so that it's not multiple weeks in a row of short weeks. Yeah, oh, do we you're saying option? to move October 10th if we know that we're going to have off and move it to the 3rd and have the 2nd and 3rd off? Is that what you're saying? Instead of there being so many weeks in a row that aren't a complete week. Okay, I will definitely take that back to the calendar committee. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davis, did you, you may have said this and I missed it because I was focused on the other question, but the PD day for pre-K yes. on October 3rd, is that, is is there a reason why that's separate than the PD day from, for K to 12? Yeah, their, their, their professional development is totally different than your K through 12. So they have their separate, I know that this year they focus on conscious discipline, which that is a program that we do not work on in um, K through 12. So they do have pro separate professional development that they may receive from the state or that is developed and designed by the principal and staff. If, if this calendar were to hold true, kindergarten or pre-K kids would have, <coughs> basically all those three Fridays off. 
because they wouldn't also come to school during parent teacher conference days and professional development day on October 10th, right? Oh, the 10th was moved to September. We don't know. That's for this year. You're talking about for 24. That's for this year. We don't know what October is going to be in 25. So you were saying to possibly move it. I mean, again, our parents prefer that if we're going to be off, that is off on Friday or Monday and not in the middle of the week. So that was another reason why it's there. I think that every year has always been on a Friday. Okay. But you're suggesting to move it to a Tuesday or Wednesday. Well, I just think by no fault of their own, right. those pre-K kids are not going to get to go to school on for three, three Fridays. Three Fridays. And if you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kid... Mm -hmm. They're not going to receive services, but twice a week for three weeks. Good point. Thank you. This is uh, November. Really, nothing has changed here. We have the week of Thanksgiving off. Next. Okay, please take a look at December. That's where you have the two weeks off for the winter break. January, we didn't change much here. You can move on. And this is spring break. And I see what you're saying because you see how Fridays are, and it's 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 been that way. And that's why, especially in elementary schools, sometimes they really try to rotate for those who have the related arts on a Friday, try to have a rotating schedule so that students don't always miss gym. I guess my question really was on a PD day, for example, if you go back to those PDs in October, do can pre-K teachers and pre-K kids attend if it's a PD day for non-pre-K teachers and they've already had their day the week prior? So for, for the 17th, the students would be off in pre-K. For October 3rd, they would be off. For October 10th, I don't recall if Michelle is here. They are off. Okay. They are off as well. Okay. So, um, Ms. Pigeon, what I can do, I definitely reach back to uh, the pre-K teachers and also the principal, but the principal is a part of this committee. Okay. And if it they, works for them, it just... Yeah, they're the ones who recommend it October yeah. 3rd, but I appreciate your eye on it. Okay. Any questions about April and May? Here we are at the end of the year. So having our half days for uh, middle school and finals and also I should say secondary. But we are looking into that just to determine that makeup day. Is that makeup day really needed? How many students actually come um, for that last day? Is there anything else that can be done? So we're we're going to spend this upcoming year just collecting data around that. That's the conclusion of my report. I leave it open for questions and comments. Just a point of reference. So in the proposed calendar, last student day, uh, 8 or 11 is June 10th. What point of reference? What is that for this school year? What's the last? Still early. It's still the, I think it's the, the sixth or the ninth. 
I don't have that calendar in front of me. Okay. I do have it in my book bag. I always carry a calendar. Hmm. But it's it's a I think it's slightly earlier or within it's like the ninth or the ninth or the tenth. Okay. Thank you. So in next month, I will return um to go over the calendar again just for um your approval. Yeah, Any I, other questions? Yes. Well, just, just a comment or um actually I do have a question. Um I guess my question is is that do we um I don't know. Do we have any comparisons to like sister districts? Like how does this compare in terms of total number number of full days and um, hours? Or... That was, that has been done before. Yeah. Even with, with my predecessor, predecessor uh, we have looked, there may be some differences of two days, uh, possibly three, but we definitely have met. And every single time we meet, we are always, as we start the year, the first thing we talk about, what are some additional opportunities that we can have for instructional time? So we are always looking for that. Yeah, I, I do see that. Thank you so much for this hourly attendance. Definitely. Just a comparison, um, because um, I can see that we are in every category. We are over. Mm -hmm. um, Surplus. Yeah. Uh, but I was just, yeah, I was just curious. Um, yeah, I would definitely just urge the community um, to you know forward your concerns about the twenty five twenty six calendar because we will be voting on it um, next month. And um, I, I personally would like to hear um, you know the community's perspective on it. And um, because I feel like you always hear about it later, but then, um, but, but this is an opportunity for people to, to view it now and to, to, to have their voice known. I, I would say concerns and compliments. There you just go. Say, You're right. Just, just, right. <laughs> just Davis, absolutely. Concerns and compliments for sure. For you. Because we, we, I have not received many contacts from, from communities and we have communities looking at this as well. Right. So I haven't, I, I won't say I've never received anything, sure. but they have always been resolved. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I do have one more question. I'm sorry. This doesn't have pre-K in the hourly. Do pre-K students no. have, do we have a requirement to fill no. hours? No. No. Okay. Because down below, it does have hours in pre-K. Um. It's so I just required. was wondering, because I know they start later, and so they probably don't have those same numbers. Same, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Any other comments or questions? Just a quick answer to President Scrobot's question of the last day for this year. Yeah. It's scheduled for Friday, June 7th. 7th, thank you. Thank That's you. student day, PK. Yes. Thank you, Superintendent Holler. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Mr. Scrobot, be, before we transition to the next presentation, uh, Mr. Ackerman, I did upload those two documents to the agenda. Thank you. Mr. President, yes. Can I make one other comment about the calendar? I just want to thank Ms. Lavinia Jones Davis because I don't know how she does it. Um, between the calendar committee, working in, with the WLC, working with the Citizens Advisory, uh, she's got to be stretched thin. And I think she's doing a great job. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Ackman. Thank you. Yeah, it's that one. It's your turn, right? For modification. Modification WLC goal setting time. You said before we move on to the next one, and you had a comment. Well, actually, uh, date. 
Reverend Perry's here, so maybe I'll just turn it over to her. Got it. I thought he was pulling something up. You got it. She threw it back to you. Oh. Uh, it's, it's right there on the agenda. There's a request uh, to modify the existing WLC MOU. There was a date in that MOU um, that was for March 31st, 2023, for the uh, goals to be written for the following year. Uh, Dr. Burgos and the WLC Council um, agreed that it would be wise to extend that date until June 30th, 2024. This would allow us to get end of year assessment data and take that into account in setting the goals for the following year. Um, I support the request, obviously, being a member of the WLC and just from a, a goal setting perspective to be able to use this year's data to set next year's goals makes perfect sense. Move okay. to accept the superintendent's recommendation. We have a motion, do we have a second? A second. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Yeah. Do you um do you recall what the original deadline date was in the original MOU before the previous was it December thirty first? Of... No, that is the original um, date. March thirty. March was the original. I, I thought we extended it previously. Didn't we extend that date previously? I think there might have been a couple drafts, but the the final oh. MOU we signed. Okay. Yeah, the final MOU was March 31st. That's the existing MOU we have now, and that's why we need to come back and extend it. Because I think even getting to the original MOU, it might have been discussed and okay. changed but that was. For the comments, questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Ms. Flory, monthly financial report for February 29th. Is this on? Yeah. Good evening, Mr. President, Vice President, members of the board, and members of the audience. I'll be very brief with my monthly report. February is the shortest month, but um, in fiscal land, as you know, it was the longest month. Um, and so I can't um, have a report without saying thank you to the community, um, but to all of the team members from our staff, uh, as well as the board who supported um, all of the work that went into the referendum. So thank you. Um, on the monthly report on the revenue side, um, we are on track exactly where we would expect to be this time of year. 98.6% um, local revenues received. The largest outstanding one is still the um, final senior property tax credit. Um, on the state side, 101% uh, received, and that's because we budget 99%. Um, so 101 uh, really brings us to 100%. But in total, state and local uh, revenues are at 92.5% received for this time of year. On the expenditure side, which goes to page three, um, we do such a good job following along. Thank you um, for managing that screen. Um, on the expenditure side, we are 61.32% expended, um, slightly lower than where we were last year and where we'd expect to be, but on track for the end of the fiscal year. The cash flow through June 30th, and I'll come back because I have a May report, so you'll hear that again in a couple of months, but still remains a $6.1 million ending balance um, and on track with all of the forecasts that went into um, the referendum projections. The committee reviewed um, the rest of ESSER funds. We have approximately 2 million left uh, for in total all ESSER funds. Um, and then the committee also reviewed prior year appropriations. The committee did vote to approve the monthly report. I told you I'd be quick. Do we have a motion to accept the monthly financial report subject to audit? So moved. Second. second. Motion and a second. Uh, any further questions or comments, Ms. Flory? Just a, a point of clarification, $2 million left in ESSER, but th that is already earmarked. Correct. Okay. Correct. We have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Flory. Thank you. Mr. President, um, before we move on to board business, just because we shuffled the order of the agenda, I'd like to ask that number 9C is moved off of the consent agenda and added to new business. So I can ask a question regarding it. Uh, I guess my parliamentarian is not here. That is moving to... Just it up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, does it so please the board to move that item up and discuss 9C? Minor cap S or change order. Are you? Are we just taking it out of the consent agenda or out of consent and moving, moving it up into new business? business. New business. Okay. Yeah. Objection. Any objection? Then I will move on to uh, open minor cap S or change order and invite Mr. John Reed down. So while you're walking up, my, my question is that the, the change orders for a little bit over 10% of what the total project cost was, um, just because it was a higher number than usual. I was wondering if you could just explain really briefly what the, the project is and why there's such a 10%. Yeah, not increase. a problem. We had our um, maintenance advisory committee in the building several weeks ago, and um, we are the general contractor. Um, that and this was the low bid. So even with a change order, we're still way underneath the other bid. But when we ordered the boilers, the boilers came with a drawing that said the boilers were X big. When they showed up, they were a lot larger due to new environmental requirements for the boilers. So good news is the smoke coming out of the stack or what's coming out of the stack is a lot cleaner. Bad news is the boilers were a lot larger and we have to fit them to, through the side of the building and drop them down and they're 22,000 pounds while keeping the school running. And right on the ground where we had to set the crane is the old abandoned oil tank. So I had a meeting with the contractor. And when you're looking at people and making sure everybody goes home safely, we have a rigging meeting as to how we're going to lift things up and how we're going to get them down. And the decision was made by myself that everybody was going to go home. And we needed larger equipment to get the boiler safely into the boiler room. So we had to do an additional crane rental and we had to rent a, um, a, a large piece of hydraulic equipment that had to be assembled in the boiler room to move the two boilers in, move the two boilers out, move the two chillers out, move the two chillers in. The piece of equipment has been removed, but this was a decision. The boilers are bigger. Um, the sprinkler line for the building had to be moved on Martin Luther King Day, but when the boilers showed up, it was a lot larger than what we ordered equipment was larger and heavier and it was a decision we would have hit this with any contractor is the boiler the boiler room was built around the old boilers and the old equipment and it doesn't come out easily in fact one of the boilers was built in the boiler room that's not how you buy things today so for efficiencies environmental requirements we got a one-piece unit and this is what we hit thank but you. things are going well the thank heat's you. on the new boiler's working Great. Thank you. I just thought, Thank yeah, you. I just wanted to hear. Uh, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. And I know we did, um, I know we saved a lot of money on this project by the ordering timeline you had mentioned in it, previous reports. It would have been a 20% markup. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Heller, just to that point, uh, uh, again, another piece of fiscal stewardship. Uh, Mr. Reed also ordered uh, the HVAC systems for uh, Brandywine High School, they have arrived. Uh, they're scheduled to be put in place this summer. So currently they're sitting in our transportation yard. Uh, again, saving us uh, dollars uh, in advanced ordering. And uh, he also acquired some used boilers from the Wilmington Library that is being remodeled that will fit nicely into uh, a part of Darley Road Elementary. Again, excellent fiscal stewardship uh, demonstrated by Mr. Reed in the facilities department. Thank you, Mr. Hoare. Uh, do we have a motion, uh, looking for a motion to accept the minor cap Esser change order? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Moves us back to the order of our lineup. Uh, board member liaison reports, DSBA executive board, Mr. Ackerman. 
The executive board met on March 6th. Uh, we had the financial projections uh, through the end of FY23 coming into the next year. At our next meeting, we will determine dues uh, for districts. Uh, it looks like we'll probably be able to keep the same calculation. We did go through the legislative committee meeting minutes from February 7th. Uh, we also discussed the NSP annual conference, which is in New Orleans, April 6th through April 8th. There are 39 Delaware board members registered for that. On Saturday night, there will be a Delaware dinner. Uh, we did get an update uh, from our representative on the DPAS 2 advisory committee. It just kind of let us know how the new um, evaluation system is going. And of course, we had the normal um, items about uh, what's going on with Legislative Hall uh, from our executive director. And uh, Darrell Green from Red Clay was the chief school officer representative to our meeting and gave us an update on the chiefs, which I believe we're about to have a retreat that same week. Is there a date for the next scheduled meeting? Uh, the next regular meeting will be May 1st. And there will be a legislative committee meeting in April. I have that here. And I will send a copy of this out uh, to board members so you can look at it once I get the final uh, version of the document. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rackman. Uh, District Finance Committee, uh, we met on March 13th. Um, CFO Joe Flory uh, discussed the valued work of the DFC in all the years leading up to the referendum. Um, the district would like to recognize the members of the District Finance Committee at a future school board meeting uh, once we can align you know, the majority of their availability. Uh, we reviewed the monthly report that she just covered for February 29th. Uh, moved into the fiscal year 25 budget planning, including the governor's recommended budget proposal and the public employee compensation committee recommendations. And our next meeting is Wednesday, April 10th, 5 p.m. Uh, maintenance advisory, Mr. Heller. Sure. Uh, either Mr. Squarebot or myself were able to attend. Uh, had, had we been, we would have known about this, uh, the details of the change order. Um, but the notes from the meeting, the two major topics were um, touring the boiler room project at Mount Pleasant and a review of that project. And then um, an extensive discussion on the Department of Education requirements under Senate Bill 270, which requires a facilities assessment document that must be approved by school boards uh, prior to May 2024. Um, and the intent of that Senate bill is that the boards evaluate the condition of each school um, statewide and are aware of school facility conditions. So we'll be seeing that document within the next uh, month or two at our meeting. And the next meeting is April 9th at Tally. April 9th at Tally, thank you. Parent and Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Stock. Yes, um, our next uh, meeting will be at Mount Pleasant Elementary this Thursday at 5.30. And the topic is going to be a multi-tier system of support, um, social emotional learning and mindfulness. Great, thank you, Ms. Stock. Uh, Parent Council for Students with Disabilities, Ms. Pigeon. Uh, the council hasn't met since our last board meeting. The next meeting is on April 23rd from 6.15 to 8 o'clock at Claymont Elementary and also via Zoom. Um, parents of students with disabilities of all ages uh, would like to um, remind the Newcastle County Transition Fair is going to be held on Thursday, March 21st from 5.30 to 8 o'clock at the Chase Center on the Riverfront. There are lots of opportunities to meet state providers um, services and resources for families of students of all ages with disabilities. And I have been in the past and I highly recommend anyone to attend. Was 321 also Rock Your Socks Day? Uh, March 31st is World Down Syndrome Day. And 31st or? Mar sorry, March 20, 21st 20, okay. is World Down Syndrome Day. Symbolizes the third chromosome on the 20, or the the triplication of the 21st chromosome. So that's the same date as the meeting, right? It's the same day as the transition fair. Fantastic, thank you. The meeting is on April 23rd. April 23rd. Uh, Wilmington Learning Collaborative Update, Reverend Dickerson. 
Um, just a friendly reminder that uh, the Wilmington Learning Collaborative will meet tomorrow, this, uh, excuse me, Tuesday, March the 19th at 6 p.m. at Shortledge Academy located at 100 West 18th Street, Wilmington. Great, thank you. Um, 91.7 WMPH Advisory Committee um, did meet this month. I do not have my notes for that update, so I will provide that at the next meeting. Uh, Just, uh, Mr. President, have we gotten an answer on what the what antenna was installed onto our tower that is making us in violation of FCC regulations? So yeah, uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. If we have an answer. Um, hang on. The issue was there was an antenna. I guess Paul Wishingrad, the CTE teacher, identified a uh, structure attached to the radio antenna that's in violation of FCC. Guidelines you can't have anything 10 feet below, above or below. Um, and at the time it was not known what it was, but it seemed that it was related to um, a Motorola piece. I don't know if that was related to, they think the um, like emergency management communications. So at the time it was in the process of getting someone scheduled to come out and lower it um, to the appropriate level. Um, but I don't have a definitive answer on what it was, but it, all indications were is that's what it, it was supposed to be there. It's just not- uh, In the wrong place. Wasn't in the right spot. And in the meeting is also mentioned that there will be some additional signage uh, created and placed at the entrance to the door that leads to the tower, uh, informing any contractors uh, not to install any equipment on the radio antenna. Thank you, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you. But the neighbors were getting great Comcast reception. <laughs> uh, any additional board member reports? I do have uh, one brief report. The Health and Wellness Planning Group, which is a subset of the Health and Wellness Committee, actually met last week to plan the agenda for the next meeting. Um, there's just a couple notable things uh, that are going to be on the agenda for the March 21st meeting. Um, there is new legislation surrounding free and reduced meals. So we're going to update on um, nutrition services and how that new legislation impacts nutrition. Um, and then there's going to be a discussion. We talked a couple months ago about the Juul settlement. So the committee is going to talk about um, the Juul settlement funding and how that can be used in um, in alignment with the settlement requirements. Um, and then there was some discussion that will be on the agenda for um, heart health and cardiac health for student athletes and how the district can support that. So that meeting will be Thursday, I believe the 21st at 4 p.m. Um, the full committee meeting. Has the Jewel funding been received or is there a targeted date? I believe it was received. Some of it, not all. Some, Some but it. not all. Right. All right. Thank you, board members, for your reports. Um, moving on to consent agenda, do I have a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda 9A and B, given that we've already discussed C? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any further to discussion on consent? No discussion on consent. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, this time I'll entertain a motion to approve the monthly personnel report as discussed in the exec session. So moved. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, do I have a motion to accept student matters as discussed in executive session? So moved. Second. A mo motion, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Leading us to general information and meeting dates. Regular board meeting scheduled Monday, April 15th here at Brandywine High School. Regular board meeting May 6th, Brandywine High School. Regular board meeting June 17th, Brandywine High School. Screw it, can I put a plug in for those dates? Uh, I'd like to include June 2nd as graduation for all three of our high schools at the University of Delaware. And we'll list those out on next month's agenda. 
Okay, great. June 2nd graduation. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our business. I will entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone, for your time and participation this evening. Enjoy the week. This concludes our March meeting.